Tom King very kindly wrote a nice um, blog piece uh, to go alongside this program, which of course is inspired by the restrictions imposed due to the COVID pan pandemic and therefore government's thinking, we've got to close schools, we've got to replace exams. And um, the net result was that Ireland and the four UK nations decided to use models taking into account information that there was about school leavers performance and determine results using those. And of course that um, the use of algorithms isn't new, but from the Royal Statistical Society po point of view, both the stats and the law and the data ethics and governance groups, which are hosting this meeting, um, the ensuing fuss did at least serve to highlight to a much wider audience, perhaps, that algorithms and judgments are used and that people might like to think about how they're used, what the alternatives might be and what the value of could be, how best to use them. Um, I'm really very pleased at the people who've agreed to join us and to speak at this meeting, say run jointly by two sections, which are one level is asking the question, can simple models outperform individual judgment? And as I say, we've got a range of people. I'm very pleased to have the Office of Statistical Responsibility. Um, we've got Ireland, Scotland, England represented. I hope we've got some Welsh uh, delegates to pitch in for Wales if nobody else does. Could I please remind you um, various things? If this is being recorded, so if you don't want to appear at all, could you please email um, Las Martinez, the, who will have sent you the joining instructions, and uh, we'll make sure that nothing you say or do appears. The other thing is, of course, could we please, um, while people are speaking, can you switch off your camera? I might leave myself visible, but basically, could you switch off your camera and mute? so that uh, we can enjoy things. Uh, do feel free to use the chat both for questions um, to the individual speaker for later, also for a little bit of side discussion if you wish. If there are too many questions, they'll be collated by um, certainly Amy, will, Amy Wilson, our, the Secretary of Stats and Law, will be keeping an eye on it. Uh, probably several of us will keep an eye on it at some stage and collate questions for the discussion. Part of the context is that algorithms are more and more consciously used, so they've been used for a long time. The Law Society in England and Wales considering what to do, and I think all of us might be able to contribute to effective and fair use of algorithms. I think everybody who wants to join is quite likely to have had a fair chance to join by now. So we're going to start with uh, Professor Carl Walsh. He's a statistician at the University of Limerick. He's got a very substantial record of collaborating with other disciplines to answer questions in healthcare and planning using statistical models and very diverse sources of evidence. So he was very well placed um, to enjoy the limelight last summer in an Irish case about how do we judge final year students. Over to you, Carl. Very good. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Jane. Um, so this is a reflection really on the Irish situation. And uh, as I mentioned before, people may have joined. Uh, we, we have had a, uh, a ransomware attack on our, on our health service. So it meant that um, my, my usual machine wasn't available. So for the last three weeks, our health service has been kind of battling with that. Um, but I do have have slides, and I have a, a different machine here. But but so hopefully it's it's um, it's working well. A picture here of Limerick. So look, if I were to look outside my office, uh, this is what I see. So the the White House, which is where the president's office is, and the fountain and so on. But unfortunately, of course, <clears throat> many of us aren't in our home institutions at the moment. Um, and this was the case, of course, last year as well, when we were doing final year exams for school students. Uh, and as Jen mentioned, we, we had to get effectively algorithms or statistics to judge our, to judge our students. Um, here with some observations on 
what's called LC2020, which is the hashtag for Twitter for leaving Cert 2020 as it was, uh, and the commotion coming up to the exams, and even during the exam process itself, or the, the estimation of grades process itself, uh, and the subsequent um, uh, court cases. I, I was an expert witness um, <clears throat> on behalf of an applicant who was looking for a judicial review um, uh, of the process itself. Um, of course, being an expert witness, your duty is to the court. And so he examined the issues, statistical issues involved uh, in the in the case itself. Some coverage then. Um, the coverage about the leaving cert was that it didn't work entirely as people might have thought. So there were brothers, for example, on the right hand side who got uh, similar results or similar estimated grades, but ended up getting different results. And and um, and there was a substantial enough difference in the points. So in Ireland, we get points for uh, subjects that we do in our Leaving Cert, and those points give you entry to college. It's a little bit different from the UK system. Uh, so we get a number of points for every subject that's undertaken and it's um, it, it really is competition in terms of who gets into college. So the estimated grades process did give people points and then some people got into college and some didn't. So there was a disparity on the right hand side there between uh, two brothers who got similar estimated grades but ended up with different, different results. The top left is about um, people who were sacrificed, as they say in the media, uh, in because of the, the, the fact that they didn't get the grades that they expected. So the estimated grades that they got might have been quite high, but a lot of them were downgraded. And this was particularly the case for so-called grind schools or um, schools where they expect to get students to perform really quite highly in the final exams uh, and get very high points. They were downgraded as well as everyone else, um, but it, it seemed as if they were sacrificed to a greater extent than other students. Um, and, and so many people didn't get the course that they applied for. Overall, what happened? Well, the grades, there was grade inflation, so the grades increased and therefore people who got reasonably good grades still didn't get into college because others overtook them. Uh, in, in the court case itself, I, I, I suggested that it was a bit like the airline queues in Italy. So if anyone's travelled to Italy, it is a bit of a scrum getting through to passport control. Uh, and so even if you move forward, you still get overtaken by others coming up beside and around you as you go through um, passport control. And, and that's what happened in the case of the Leaving Cert in Ireland, that people got seemingly good grades, perhaps better than they anticipated, but were overtaken by others and therefore didn't get a college place. Um, not only that, that during the process of the estimation of grades, and it was carried out by a, 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 a company that was external to Ireland, the, the estimation of people's grades, there was a number of problems identified and, and it, it was classed in the media as coding problems and six and a half thousand students got incorrect grades. The reason was that there was a, it was meant to take the best two out of three, so it was core subjects were taken into consideration in terms of your point calculations, and then it was meant to take the, the best two out of three uh, subjects, and it actually took the worst two subjects instead of the best two. And so that was a, an error in the coding, and also subjects that weren't intended to be included. So um, subjects like, uh, um, CSP, so so um, uh, studies that really weren't normally exam subjects uh, were included in the calculation of grades, uh, and 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 that was problematic, and that was essentially deemed as a coding error. But of course, it was a, a data feed error that, that the data shouldn't have been fed forward, uh, but it was. So the problem, as as many know, was to create a grade for each student, given information that we have. The information that was available was previous performance plus some estimation of the student's performance given by the schools. So here's an example. Uh, a particular student got A grades in English, French, history, uh, B in math, science, geography, and a C in the Irish exam, let's say, 
in the junior certificate exams. So, so previous performance was taken into account at junior set level. Also taken into account was the delay between the time that you sat the junior cert and the time you sat the leaving cert. And this was taken into account because some people may repeat exams, but also there were some students who may have done transition year, uh, which is a, a gap between junior cycle and senior cycle. And that was seen as a, a, a binary variable and was taken into account in the statistical model. Um, so th this information was used in the predictive algorithm. This information is the information that was recorded. This is verbatim from the um, Department of Education and Skills. We see Unrhein and Dockish, uh, which is the education department at the top there uh, in, in Irish. And, and this is the information that, that was recorded for um, every student. Um, so the mark for a given student was recorded, the estimated grade by the teachers. They were reviewed by the principal and then submitted to the Department of Education. The other bit of information that was um, taken into account was the ranking of students. And there was disagreement during the court case about this. So the, the algorithm itself did maintain rank order of students, but there was some question as to whether or not that was a reasonable thing to do. I know there's been commentary in the UK about that. Um, in the Irish situation, rank ordering was maintained, uh, but given the uncertainty in the grade, and in fact, <laughs> the algorithm itself used at plus or minus 2%. So if you were given a grade of 56%, for example, then the algorithm was fed that this is 56% plus or minus 2% effectively. Uh, um, then, of course, there could be swapping of, of, of rank ordering of students given previous performance, but that was not allowed for. Um, so this is the data that was recorded, the estimated mark itself for a student in numerical terms plus the rank ordering within a class. Uh, if there were different grades of subjects, so there's higher ordinary and foundation level, then they were done separately. What were the features of the data collected? And I've, I've pointed out some, some features here, and this is from the report post uh, exams from the Department of Education. And it's a strange graph uh, on the left hand side, but, but one is the highest grade that can be achieved, H1, H2, H3, and so forth to, to, to eight. So eight is a, a lower grade. Um, the school estimated mark is given by the red line here. So the red line on the left, solid red line, is the percentage of, of, of people in each category. And of course, this is, this is their graph. So this is a graph from the report, um, and they've joined them up. <laughs> but nonetheless, so of the order of about 12, 13% of people got a H1, uh, of the order of 20% of people got a H2, and so on. And comparing this to previous years, we can see that a much larger, larger proportion of people got a H1 uh, than in previous years. Also on the right hand side, we can see that a much lower proportion of people got a H8, H7, H6, than in previous years as well, H5. Um, so there was an element of grade inflation in school estimated marks, mean that it was the school that attributed these marks uh, and, and, and so the teachers effectively. And so there was quite a substantial amount of grade inflation and this was commented on during the um, uh, case itself. On the right hand side, the actual percentage marks, and this is um, for a given subject, across all subjects actually, aggregated. And we can see that we see the what, what would be called the normal um, rounding effect uh, at boundaries. So teachers shied away of giving marks very close to a boundary. Uh, you've got a nice distribution in between the, uh, for example, 70% and 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 80% um, uh, and a, a dip in between those great boundaries. And that differed actually by subject. So some subjects, the distribution wasn't as marked as this. In other subjects, particularly quantitative disciplines of science and maths, we did see this effect um, quite strongly indeed. Um, in some subjects, it wasn't apparent because um, the marks were the teacher's marks combined with coursework during the year. And so overall, we didn't get this effect. Um, I, I, I know this is seen in other circumstances as well. For example, I know um, the classic example of petrol pump rounding. We see this kind of rounding effect as well, where we get this, this um, artifact in the, in the data itself. Well, the, in terms of the detail, 
uh, the document itself is available. So the document that the Department of Education produced, considering the process and giving the results, is available. And the bits that it emphasizes uh, in the appendices, in fact, you can get an awful lot of the detail. So the, the bit to emphasize is that this was very much a process. Uh, so it was a modeling seen as a modeling process rather than a black box algorithm. And there was a feedback between the analysts themselves and a committee who reviewed the results of the uh, of the output, if you like, of the algorithm. Uh, it's described as an iterative exploratory confirmatory cycle uh, that was tuned. And of course, this is at a population level rather than looking at any particular students uh, individually. Um, different weighting strategies were used and different models were used throughout the way. We, we actually still don't know the details, the full details of the models that were used. Uh, and there was a, a national standards group that did review the output um, and they said that it was a larger considerations uh, involved. One of the final parts of the modeling was to standardize the marks so they'd be equivalent to previous years. But in the event, that didn't happen. And so we ended up with great inflation overall, which meant that the results from 2020 weren't comparable to previous years, and they're not comparable to future years either, of course, because we have a higher proportion of people get high grades. As a slight aside, um, this appeared in the Ottawa um, uh, newspaper. So it was the analyst who was involved was subjected to quite a lot of criticism from, from people within Ireland, but also uh, with it, even within Canada. There was some suggestion that there was some failure on behalf of the analyst. In my view, of course, that isn't the case. The failure, if anything, was that the incorrect data had been provided to the analyst uh, who was based in, in Canada. Someone working in educational theory, a very strong background, had worked previously with the Irish uh, establishment and who was used to analyze the grades independent from Ireland. An awful lot of work and um, much criticism in the Irish media about the cost involved, but actually not a lot of money for the, the amount of work that, that was involved in, in, in my view. Indeed, the subsequent court proceedings would have cost an awful lot more than um, the analysis itself. Interesting from the appendix as well, we, we have some detail about the models that were that were used uh, and taking straight from the document itself, uh, there's descriptions about a more complex model that was used, 13L, uh, which was a mixture model that was looking at um, to, to allow for the fact that we have some small schools uh, and that we have some schools where there may be very high marks obtained in some subjects. For example, some schools teach completely in the Irish language and they're expected to get very high grades in Irish, but the model had to be adapted to allow for that. So it had to allow for the fact that we got clusters of people who got high grades in some exams. Model 18A and following were described as a response to the trend in public discourse. And essentially this occurred after the results in Scotland were released and there was some concern in Ireland that it is inequitable to use school prior performance in the determination of results. So there were a number of factors, a number of things that were included so that students marks estimated grades themselves were used, their previous junior cycle performance, the association between their junior cycle and leaving cert performance from previous cohorts was used, but also the school previous performance was used in order to ground the marks that were obtained in given subjects. In the movement from models 18A forward, that information was removed. So the school level information was removed. Uh, and, and this was the subject of the judicial review, if you like. OK, so reflections then. Uh, statistically, this is a really difficult problem, you know, so this is a, a difficult ask and, 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 and we essentially were making up grades for students who didn't sit the exams and we're using very limited information uh, and coming up with some estimate of how well do we think they would have done, essentially counterfactual, um, what would have happened if there wasn't a pandemic. Uh, 
very difficult um, uh, question to to answer. If I'm if I'm being honest, I think the Department of Education did try extremely hard to the to do the best they could. They hadn't seen a situation like this before. Um, they were used to doing things the usual way, and this was put upon them. They weren't helped by people within health, for example, the indications of whether or not the exams would go ahead or not. There was no decision on that at an early stage. Um, a decision was taken for the exams not to go ahead in the usual way. Uh, and they did, the, in my view, as, as well as could be anticipated, given the challenges that were forced upon them. Um, the judgment in Ireland is interesting in that it says that the marks that the student got were, were, were in fact unlikely to be the statistic, the statistical estimates of what they would have got had they done the exams, but that they they weren't that different uh, in terms of the impact on where they're going to go from there on their higher education. In other words, they did get fewer points in their leaving cert than they would have, but given their choices for college entry, it wouldn't have impacted upon their cho choice or where they would have their destination in, in, in college. They didn't they didn't not get into their chosen course because of the process itself. And um, in fact, their estimated grades, their best case scenario is slightly less than their first first choice for college, for example. And um, the judgment itself is also the judge did listen very carefully to the questions that were raised. Uh, very difficult because at the time, and, and the case ran through December uh, of last year into January of this year. And during January, I think the judge was very well aware that we're going to have a similar process this year. One of the questions that the judge asked was, well, why don't we go back? And a very sensible question. Why don't we go back and ask the teachers what previous cohorts of students would have done in terms of their leaving cert? And we can use that to calibrate their judgment. And so it'll be different. It'll be it'll be a good way to decide how to correct for um, teachers overestimation. Very sensible suggestion. But of course, we already know what what students got, so we couldn't go back and do that in retrospect. What's been decided in Ireland for this year is that we will allow students to do exams, and also in parallel have the estimation process, so that we'll have some element of calibration between what students get in an exam situation and the estimated grades themselves. So the, even the judge knew that there is a better way to do this uh, and, and, and came up with a sensible suggestion himself, um, but was faced with coming up with a judgment as well. Um, he accepted in the judgment that yes, statistical accuracy was sacrificed, but the legitimate expectations of the student in terms of how they're going to progress and how their second level education was credited was not compromised. And so there was no reason to go back uh, and do something different or to give some other uh, uh, detail to the student or to give some other um, uh, outcome to the student uh, in terms of their um, where they would go uh, in college. And that was largely due to the fact that there wasn't that much difference between the students um, estimated grades uh, and the actual grades that were obtained uh, in, 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 in the end uh, and, and where they would have progressed. So from, from the statistician's point of view, and this is thanks to the other expert witness, so Wim van der Linden from the Netherlands, um, who, who has worked for many years in this area of uh, educational statistics and uh, who, who has, uh, who's now retired, um, we both agreed and we met that the task was very difficult, not an easy one to resolve. Um, the modeler was to be given full credit for the task that was put upon them. It was an incremental process. Uh, they dealt with it sensibly. Uh, the results were reviewed by a high level committee. Now, the from models 18A onwards, if one reads the fine print, it's clear that the decisions that were made in the very final stages and the ones that were at issue really with the in, in terms of the judicial review um, they that those decisions perhaps were put upon the committee rather than being made for statistical reasons. So the removal of the school level information, for example, 
uh, was because of the public discourse rather than for statistical reasons, and it did make a difference, and the committee weren't entirely happy. But the process of modelling itself was done in a very sensible way, involved human input, uh, and was an incremental process. Nonetheless, the details themselves were opaque. Uh, I had access to very limited information, um, and uh, Vim, who, who was um, an expert witness on behalf of the state, uh, did have access to more information, but still felt that he didn't have as full information as perhaps he might have. So the key concerns that we had was that the, the, the level of information, the details of the model, and the implications of the interim models and the ranking of students weren't clear to us um, uh, uh, throughout and even weren't clear to us afterwards. And so that was a challenge. The judgment itself, and we'll finish on this, um, that the judge said, and this is coming from the judge's um, uh, decision, uh, 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 judgment, uh, fee-paying fee schools which had historically high values didn't get as good results as they, th as they thought they might. Um, they they felt the judge felt that it would be it wouldn't be acceptable publicly to factor this in to the awarding of calculated grades uh, that this would be systematic inequality even if the statistical in a statistical sense people who go to fee paying schools should get higher grades according to the model they, the model that was finalised they wouldn't uh, and. He felt he wanted to shop, stop short of factoring uh, that into the model. Um, the statistical model that would give higher grades to some people, especially those going to fee paying schools, wouldn't be acceptable publicly. But in any event, the final decision, the final judgment was that this was a decision of government. And because it was decided at cabinet that this was the way to proceed, it's not something that he wanted to interfere with uh, in terms of being a member of the judiciary and therefore the the judicial review ended up with um the status quo if you like so there was no change made in the event okay uh, excellent. excellent not quite not sure, sure. Feedback. do we have any questions does anybody want to put their hand up or Amy, feed a question in other than mine. Tom? Tom put a question in the chat if you want to. Yeah. Was social media a, a strong factor in promoting the case and would this apply to other less privileged groups? Um, well, I mean, certainly I think social media was an issue in, in terms of the um, deciding on the process itself, I think there was a, a, a around the time before the exams, before the exams themselves, uh, to push for not having exams sat and to have calculated grades. Uh, I mean, that was promoted on social media and the students uh, hashtag LC2020 was very much, yes, let's not have to sit exams. Um, at the time after the event, I think you're right. I think um, I think yes, it was discussed, but there wasn't. I have to say much sympathy for uh, uh, th those who went to fee-paying fee schools um, among the, the 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 social media groups. I think it was recognised that some people did lose out, um, uh, but they did have the option, and I followed. And and there were a number of people who who I think there was uh, there were over seventy cases. Um, this was the lead case, and so this was a, a test case, if you like, and and for that reason, the um, a lot of time was spent considering the issues. Um, the the, um, it, it, the so so the, a number of the other cases fell away, and the reason was because even though it is, you know, an important year, people do have the opportunity to sit the exams again if they so wish, uh, and some people went off and did that. Other people had positions in universities in the UK. The UK was very accommodating in terms of uh, you didn't get a C, but you should have got a C in this subject. You didn't get an A, but you, you know, in the normal course of events, you would have got an A. Um, whereas we don't have that flexibility in our system. Uh, I think people did have other opportunities and and ended up taking up those posts. So, um, so, so social media was really important at the time of the exams themselves, uh, less so at the time of, of, of this case, uh, which actually didn't get that much attention, uh, but was an important case in terms of 
testing the issues, I think, that were in, involved. I think the key issue is the judge effectively said, look, statistically, it's not accurate, but actually it doesn't matter that much. And in fact, if I was to make it more accurate, there'd be a public outcry and it, it would be just reinforcing inequality uh, effectively in the system. So which is which is unusual, you know, given the given that we think that algorithms reinforce in inequality. In this case, it's, uh, it, it's actually avoided the, the inequality that we perceive to, to, to be there. Great, thanks very much. If we, if people have other questions as they, they listen and think, please save them up for later. Um, I do think some of those quotes could be quite fun to see what the panel members think. Now, of course, we had our own uh, <clears throat> version of the outcry in England uh, to the extent that the Royal Statistical Society publicly requested a review and uh, the Office for Statistics Regulation did indeed uh, carry out a review and provided lessons that could be learned. And so I'm very pleased to welcome Emily Carlos uh, from the Office for Statistics Regulation. Her focus is on children and education at OSR. And she's going to tell us about public confidence in statistical models or how to ensure it. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Jane, for that introduction. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. My name is Emily Carlos, and um, I'm the lead statistics regulator for children education and skills statistics at the Office of Statistics Regulation. And I led the review um, that we carried out into the approach to developing statistical models designed for awarding grades in 2020. The aim of this review was to learn lessons from 2020 and ensure that statistical models can command public confidence in the future. So this afternoon, I'll briefly explain who OSR are, why we did the review, what we learned about public confidence in statistical models in 2020, the lessons for the future, and what we in OSR are going to do in the future. My colleague Michael Hodge will also join me at the end for any questions as he will be taking forward much of this work. So the Office of Statistics Regulation. So we are the regulatory arm of the UK Statistics Authority and we promote and safeguard the production and publication of official statistics. We don't produce any statistics and we are separate from the Office for National Statistics. Indeed, we actually regulate um, the Office for National Statistics as well as the statistics from other departments. And our vision is simple, that statistics should serve the public good. As regulators, it is our role to support confidence in statistics by addressing harms and making sure that statistics serve the public good. And and you may have seen sort of some of our interventions over the, the last year reported uh, in the press where we've, we've written letters um, and so on. So I think um, by virtue of being in this meeting, I, I presume that we're all fairly familiar with this um, with this story. But um, to iterate, and, and Kathleen and, and Jane both sort of talked about, about, about this. In spring 2020, public exams in the UK were cancelled due to the pandemic. The qualifications regulators in each of the, in each country of the UK was tasked with overseeing the development of, of an alternative way of awarding grades using statistical models. However, when the results were released, first in Scotland and then in the rest of the UK, there was widespread concern and a public backlash against statistical models that were used um, and statistical models more generally. This resulted in the results being reissued based on the grades that teachers had initially submitted to awarding organisations. Um, as Jane has mentioned, the RSS did sort of um, ask us to, to carry out a review um, of this, um, and we did do so. But for us, the exams algorithm story is about more than just exams. Public confidence and statistics have been shaken, algorithm had become a dirty word. Um, and we wanted to ensure that the lessons that were learned, that lessons could be learned from the experience across the UK and for everyone involved in statistical models and algorithms to have a clear way forwards. So we could see that our regulatory framework, the Code of Practice for Statistics, was a useful framework for reviewing what had happened. At the heart of the code, it's about ensuring that statistics serve the public good. Um, and this underpins our social technical approach. Um, which is around not, not looking at necessarily the, the technical, because this was not a technical review of what happened, but the social impact and the public good as a result of the use of statistics. And this is very much built into our code of practice and allows us to contribute what we feel is a unique um, position in public debate. And our view was of the approach to developing the models as opposed to technical models themselves. 
Having said that, and it not being a technical review, I think it is probably worth noting here that there were substantial differences in the actual models that have been developed in each country. In all the countries, centres, that is schools and colleges, submitted a centre assessed grade and a ranking for each pupil. In Scotland, they also submitted a refined band within grade, so this split the, the pupils within grades into smaller bands. The biggest difference between the models in the all four countries was between Scotland and the rest of the UK. In Scotland, they model tolerances around the previous grade distribution that a centre had achieved. And only if the centre test grades were outside of that submitted, were well, outside of that, that tolerance distribution, um, were those centre assessed grades changed. And the minimum number of refined bands were moved between grades to achieve the, the, the tolerance so that the results would then be within the tolerance for that particular centre. In England, Wales and Northern Ireland, a set of grades for the centre was modelled and these grades were allocated to students based on the ranking that had been provided by the, by the teachers. However, there were also differences um, in the way that those models, those grades were modelled, um, particularly you know, at A-level, and this is particularly due to the differences in the structure of the qualifications and the data that was available. So in Wales and Northern Ireland, A-levels are unitised, meaning that students had already banked an AS grade that contributed to their final A-level grade. So the A-level grades were modelled using a similar process to that used when a, model miss, when a student misses an exam. Um, so there's a, a defined way of taking the, the previous, the banked information, um, and estimating what grade that student would have gotten in the final A-level. Um, so that was that was moved, ha, used. However, those model grades were not allocated directly to the, the pupils. So they were put into the pot for the centre and those were then allocated out um, using the rankings. In England, A-levels are linear, so this banked evidence was not available. So instead, a set of grades was modelled using the previous grade distribution um, at the centre, adjusted for differences in the prior performance of the current and previous cohorts. So that's a very high level um, overview of what the models were and some of the kind of key differences between the, the countries but I think it's it's useful to note that there were actual differences in, in the technical models themselves um, as well as in the approach that was taken to developing those models. So what did we find in our review? In considering the approach to developing the models in 2020 we found eight key factors that we believe influence public confidence in the exam models and I will go into them in more detail now. So the confidence in models in this context, well, as we're all aware, model, all models have limitations and uncertainty. And this situation created lots of challenges, but there was a very high level of confidence placed um, in the model itself, right up to sort of results day that the rhetoric was very much, you know, we've got a really good model, these are gonna be the right grades for, the, for these students. However, there were a number of factors that kind of impacted um, maybe on, on the ability to have that level of confidence. So the novelty of the approach, nothing like this had ever been tried before. There was not an opportunity to test the model and refine it over several iterations, for example. It was all very new. There were quite strong constraints put on the model. So statistical models are based on a number of assumptions and the data that are available. And the results from statistical models are subject to variability. In the way that grade awarding context, the models were expected to predict a single grade for each individual on each course within the constraints around not around maintaining standards and not disadvantaging any groups. Variability um, in grades in a normal year was another factor that kind of you need to think about in, in how confident you are in your model. In the normal year, there are many sources of variability in grades beyond student ability. These include performance on the day, what topics come up, variability between markers and others. Even the usual processes do not necessarily feel, fully deal with all of these um, sources. So there's a great deal of variability in, the, in those grades that you're actually trying to predict. There were also, as I touched on a little bit already, um, limitations in the data that was available. There was very little data to build these models on. Centre assessed grades and rankings had not previously been collected in this way. They're not the same as predicted grades used for university applications, for example. So there's quite a lot of limitations in, in the, the data that is actually available. They were very tight timescales. So there was four months from the start to the finish of this process, and all the steps had to be carried out in terms of developing the model, quality assuring the data, and all these things. So it was a very, very tight time out, turnaround. In addition, all the results had to be released to all students on the same day 
and life-changing decisions were actually made on those on that day. So having that confidence in the statistical model without sort of being able to iterate around, look at the re results um, and, and test them out, uh, everything had to come out on the, on the one day and life-changing decisions were actually made on, on that day. So we feel this had a, had a, a impact on the overall public confidence because there was this rhetoric of, of high confidence in the model but what then when people looked at it deeper they said but there were these various things that mean you know is that confidence really justified the transparency of the model and its limitations so Cathal has commented already on sort of the opaqueness of the, the models in Ireland and to a certain extent you know the same thing was felt uh, in England so it was important for the 2020 grades to command respect and for people to regard them as comparable to the grades awarded in the normal year but the 2020 awarding process was in the public eye in a far greater extent than a normal year. This was a novel approach, um, which like any statistical approach had limitations. Um, the qualifications regulators we feel undertook a whole variety of, of activities to communicate information about the models for those affected, published a sort of reams technical documentation on results day. Um, but the full details of what around the methodology to be used were not published in advance. Um, and this may have impacted on, on the kind of public confidence in the models because people weren't quite sure what how are these models actually going to work. There were a variety of reasons why this was the case. The short timescales, as I've already touched on, really tight timescales, um, the communication of um of information about the model would be using up resources that would otherwise be used actually in developing and running the model itself. So there's some issues around kind of being able to do all of this in, in this time scale. There's a design not to cause anxiety among students, particularly one, one country sort of reported to us um, that not, you know, not all the students' grades were going to be changed. So they didn't want to be sort of talking too much about the fact that grades were going to be changed because it would worry those whose whose grades weren't going to change um, and so there was a sort of desire not to cause that anxiety. Um, prior to the centre assessed grades being submitted there was concerns about the impact on the centre assessed grades um, if you gave lots of information about how the model was going to work would that mean that the teachers kind of adapted to the grades that they, they might submit. Um, there was also something around the confidence in the qualification system versus the confidence in, in the model. It was felt that if you talked a lot about the limitations of the model, limitations of the approach that you were going to be taking, then that might un undermine confidence in the qualification system. Whereas from our point of view and sort of from our code and trustworthiness um, and transparency side of things, actually um, making more information available on how the model was going to work and the limitations may have actually improved public confidence because people would have understood what was happening better. The use of external challenge, and I know this was uh, something that was very close to the RSS's heart at, at the time. Um, so we found that the qualifications regulators did draw on quite a bit of expertise within the qualifications and the education context. Uh, and there was quite extensive analysis carried out in order to make the decisions around the key concepts in the model, including sort of technical advice group in England, but also sort of use of external contractors, cross nation groups. They were all talking to uh, each other a, a lot. Despite this, we felt there was more limited kind of professional cons statistical consensus on the proposed methods and the methods were not exposed to the wisest possible audience of analytical and subject matter experts. Um, and we feel this may have undermined confidence in, in the models. So again, one of the barriers to this were the timescales and the resources. Um, there were, it was also reported to us, so there's no obvious group to go to uh, in confidence. As we've said, we didn't, that, you know, they didn't um, want information on the, on the model uh, in the public, too much information available uh, that might impact on how the grades would be calculated. So at that stage of the development, um, they were quite conscious of, of trying to keep quite a tight group in terms of uh, of who they would who they were sure sharing the information with however we feel that the result of this was an impact on public confidence as there was the limited professional consensus and this meant there were dissenting voices there were people saying we don't think this is going to be the right model there are other ways of doing things and without that dialogue and that that external technical challenge the result of getting those things resolved then that may have impacted um, on the public confidence and in addition, there may, may have resulted in a, sort of a lack of apparent validity of the overall model. There was a lot of work done looking at each step of how the model was built up. But without that external challenge that looks back and looks at the whole thing and goes, well, hang on a minute, you know, does this look valid as an overall model? 
um, then that may have under, undermined that that that, valid, that apparent validity and therefore public confidence. So understand the understanding of the impact of the historical patterns on the input data and the perception of bias. So in all four countries, previous grades were used as an input, um, and these had patterns of attainment which were, which are known to differ between groups, and those then fed through to the results. And this created a perception that the model had created that bias. So we feel your models are not specifically biased in their own right, and they do not create those inequalities. Differences in the outcomes in the group between groups arise from the patterns in the historical data and the assumptions you make about how that data is, is treated as you go through. Um, and as, as is the case in the model used in England, the previous history at grades at the centre was a major input to the grades that the students in 2020 um, would receive at that centre. And those historical growth results show that pupils with some characteristics have lower attainment and this may have then led to the lower performance of, of pupils from, from that centre. But this is as a result of that, that kind of the historical information um, and that's um, the, the assumption that centres that had performed at a certain level previously would continue to perform at that level. So quality assurance, we felt there were there were clear examples of good quality assurance of both the input and the, the output data. So there's guidance provided to centres, there were lots of checks to the processes. Um, there were subject matter expert groups um, that were looking at the output data, looking at sort of the feasibility and, and, and uh, of those results for that particular subject. Um, there was dual coding of the system. So, for example, in in, in Northern Ireland, um, they had a completely separate company code and run the the results completely separately. And it wasn't until the two systems agreed that they accepted the results. So that's that's good quality assurance um, and that use of external contractors. However, there was also significant challenges. So the timing, the time for training and moderation for the teachers, if you're able to do more moderation of the results before you get them in, then the quality of that data is likely to be higher. There were some issues around sort of the legal advice on when it was appropriate to go back to centres. So could you go back to individual centres um, and query the data they provided or query the results of the model? If you didn't go back to all centres, would that not be a fair approach because you weren't treating all centres equally? Um, limited analysis maybe of the outliers, so the, the very large differences between centre assessed grades um, and, the, and the final calculated grades. In addition, centre assessed grades were not sort of necessarily seen as a valid comparator um, because the sort of the published literature, previous literature has sort of shown that maybe teachers or, or individuals are not necessarily that that good at, at, at predicting an exact grade for, for, um, for an individual. Um, and they you know, when you look at the previous data, sort of up to 50% will be different from, from the actual final grade that the pupil received. So they weren't really seen as that, that valid comparator. Um, we also felt that the appeals process was expected to correct a lot of issues that maybe could have been dealt with, with earlier. And so this quality assurance, um, we felt impact, potentially impacted on, on the kind of confidence in the results as, as when the results came out, some of these issues may have been resolved prior to results day if a different approach had been taken. Uh, public engagement and acceptability testing. So there was a lot of work done um, on en engagement, particularly Ofqual carried out focus groups uh, with teachers, parents, students and so on. Um, and they also um, carried out formal consultations in, in several of the countries. They published video explainers. There was there was lots of, of public engagement going on. Um, however, where that acceptability testing was carried out, um, in hindsight, it was found maybe the focus was primarily on the testing of the process of calculating grades and not on the impact on the individuals. Um, as once the Scottish results came out, that is when they sort of saw a change in, in the responses they were getting back from that acceptability testing. When people realised, hang on a minute, it could be my child or or, or me or my students whose grades are, are lower than the centre assessed grades. And this may have led to the regulators not fully appreciating the risk that there will be public concern about the awarding of, of grades. Um, boarding understanding of the exam system, I think we've also already touched on this, you know, statistical evidence and expert judgments um, support the, the setting of grade boundaries in, in a normal year. But this may not be well understood by the public. It's a well established process um, and as a such it sort of commands a public confidence and, and acceptance. Um, but this year seemed novel. It seemed like suddenly statistics were going to be used to, to, to input into the into the grades. Um, and maybe it wasn't fully recognised that actually 
this data, you know, a lot of this data is already used um, in, in predicting grades or in um, finalising the grades. And lastly, models have different forms and functions. With some, the model makes a decision, such as bank card fraud and automated car. Um, with others, the results of a model inform a human decision. And this involvement um, is often known as, as the human in the loop. In both types of model, humans are involved in the setting up of the model, um, setting the assumptions, the coding, and so on. But they can also be involved in reviewing the outputs of the model to assess the robustness of the assumptions and the impact on results. And then assumptions and parameters can be tweaked uh, based on those judgments and, and sort of feedback through in order to improve the model. So the exam models all included human involvement setting up the model, um, but there was variability in the extent to which human involvement was used um, in reviewing the results and feeding back through. And in this case, the models sort of tended to make the decision as opposed to supporting them. So one thing that could have improved public confidence may have been if the results were fed back through to the teachers in terms of what how that those were then awarded and there may have been other ways of doing it but this this perception that computer says no and that there was no human involvement may well have impacted on, on public confidence so very briefly I've, I've talked through the main factors and i think that's probably of most interest for this meeting um our lessons for, from this for others um is Developers of the model should make sure they are open and trustworthy, rigorous and ensure quality throughout and meet the needs and public um, provide public value. And we've identified sort of 40 individual lessons underneath those three principles um, that model future model development um, should, should consider and, and think about. In addition, um, commissioners of the model should really have a role to play in this as well. So they need to think about whether a statistical model is always is the right approach for their needs. Um, statistical models used to support decisions are more than just automated processes. As I've said, there, there are assumptions and, and various things, and, and the commissioners of models need to be involved in that those, those discussions. Um, and also the development of statistical models should be regarded as more than just a technical exercise. As we have found, ensuring public confidence is not just about the technical design, it is supported through the whole end-to-end -end process. And lessons for the centre of government. There's a fast emerging community in statistical models, algorithms, AI, machine learning, and so on. But even just listing those terms, the landscape and the terminology is confusing, particularly for those new to the model developments uh, and implementation. And there were a few places where we felt actually there was quite limited guidance and, and practical case studies, particularly around public acceptability and, and transparency. Um, and so a lot of work, more work needs doing in order to provide that better support um, and to make it clear um, what guidance is relevant and so on. And uh, professional um, oversight support should also be available um, to support public bodies developing models, including the clear place to go for the technical expertise and ethics expertise, um, you know, where, where public bodies are, are developing models um, to make decisions, particularly about individuals. And that's where our recommendations sit. I won't go through those recommendations here, but they are in the report if people are interested, but that's, that's where our recommendations are, are sort of aiming for some improvements. So what are OSR doing next? So this is sort of, as I said, my, my colleague Michael Hodge will join us for, for any questions on this side of things as he'll be taking this forward. But we'll be producing our own guidance um, this year, which sets out in more detail how statistical models should meet the code of practice for statistics. We will clarify a regulatory role when statistical models and algorithms are used in public bodies, by public bodies. Sorry. So to a certain extent, you know, are we going to carry out a review of this scale for every single model? Um, that's probably <laughs> unlikely. So we need to make it very clear what is our regulatory role and where, when would we um, carry out work in this area. And we will also be working with those um, to whom we have made the recommendations um, to ensure that we can embed those recommendations and um, get an improvement here. Um, so thank you and questions. Thank you very thank much, you very much. Emily. Emily. Um, uh, there are a couple, a couple of questions, questions in the, in the chat. chat. Uh, uh, Joanna, Joanna or Phil David? David. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, um, Joanna Williams, Joanna Williams, do you want to ask your question in your own voice? Uh, thank you. Yes, I wondered on the question of public acceptability and um, that was a really great overview of the review that was carried out um, I just wondered about the the particular impact of the change in the external circumstances that the 
the solution was perhaps designed at a point where we really were life and death, you know, the, the visions of the Italian hospitals on television, uh, bin bags for nurses and so on. And then by the time the the public were asked to receive the results, as it were, and, and see the impact on individuals, uh, it was a very different world. You know, we were back to going going out and living life in a more or less normal way. So I wondered about your thoughts on that. So, so in terms of, of whether that sort of change in the external circumstances affected how acceptable people found the model to be? Yes. And I suppose as a consequence, well, you know, how would we deal with that if it occurred again in future where you're designing in one set of world circumstances, um, but needing to deliver in a different set? OK, um, that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it's not something that we looked into in, in detail in this review. We, we kind of used our regulatory framework, our, our code, to look through the steps and the process that, that had been that had been taken. But it's certainly something that uh, people would, would need to, to think about. I mean, of course, to say that for the time when they were developing the model, they, you know, absolutely, we, we were in, in that world and we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and even at, at the the point at which the students would have taken the exams, we were still very much sort of locked down. Um, so I would say there probably wasn't an alternative way of doing it um, at this point. Um, but it's certainly worth sort of thinking about the, the context into which you're putting results on the model and making sure you're fully explaining why things are done the way they are. Good. Um, Tom, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to ask it? Silence from Tom. So, has enough been done to explain to the public how difficult the technical problem was and to stand up for the professionalism of the analysts involved? Ooh, that's, a, that's a very, very interesting question. And um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, partly that, you know, the, uh, at the time when the models were being developed, part of this not wanting to kind of underpin the uh, so undermine the confidence in, in the qualification system. Uh, it probably wasn't fully explained technically how difficult this, this was going to be. Um, in terms of, if you're thinking, you know, could this review have stood up for um, statisticians more? I mean, we very much, as we went through this review, we're coming at it from the view, viewpoint of um, sort of not making sort of judgments in, in hindsight and really trying to identify the lessons going forwards. So where some people were maybe sort of expecting a, a review that sort of said they did all this wrong, we very much tried to make sure we weren't doing that and we were making sure that we were saying these are the things that, that need to, to be done uh, better in, in the future, or these are the things that, that people need to, to consider. Um, I think there probably is still quite a bit of work to do here. As I said, sort of right at the beginning, um, algorithm it had potentially become a dirty word. And if, if you look at the rhetoric around sort of summer 2021, um, that is sort of continuing, particularly in the, in the education space. So I think there still is work to be done. I don't know, Michael, whether you have any additional thoughts on this. Just, yeah, it's the it was a very difficult task and you know even if you tried to repeat it in that time frame it would be a difficult task once again um the communication of how difficult these things are just needs to be better i think um and as we've done here as emily's done here looking through the lens of the code of practice and how this fits in this is something we want to happen going forward so those elements of difficult, how difficult these things are, they're easily available for people to see. You you have that good communication with people to say, okay, this is how we've produced it. These are the people we've spoken to. This is how we've designed it. These are the steps. This is, we're showing you how difficult this is. And then at the end of it, okay, we're having a human in the loop. We've got an appeals process, et cetera. So instead of kind of, bigging the algorithm up, the models up that you create as an analyst, be quite transparent in the process that it is very difficult to do these things and that there is life after that algorithm that people can have a say in, you know, how it impacts them, especially in public life like this. Good, thank you. Uh, the programme now has a quarter of an hour break for us to get up and look to the distance so that our eyesight doesn't get ruined and things like that. Uh, and we're also just going to check that the next two speakers are 
everything to, uh, is fine with sharing the screen. So um, you're all welcome to just wander off and have a, a little walk around. And uh, Lindsay Patterson and David Hand will just check their slides. And I'll uh, just say that we're delighted that our Scottish contribution comes from Lindsay Patterson, uh, School of Social and Political Science. Um, I very much like the title, Reflection on Bi the subtitle, Bias, Noise and Politics, uh, which I think actually is a suitable follow-on from Emily's comments about uh, what they were trying to achieve with the Office for Statistical Regulation and encouraging people to understand that algorithms um, are not the dirty words. Uh, algorithms reflect what's happening. They don't necessarily invent it. OK, thank you, Lindsay. Over to you. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to this already fascinating meeting. I've enjoyed the first part. I'm going to offer some reflections on the use of statistics during the events of last summer. I'll be using some specific empirical examples from Scotland, but I think the points are general for, for all parts of these islands that we've been talking about today. I'm very grateful to the Leverhulme Trust for funding a fellowship on which I happened to be working when this all happened on measuring statistical measurement of educational inequality, but neither Leverhulme nor I expected that this would be part of what I might be talking about. The overall themes of what I'm going to say are that the, de the debate last year was almost entirely about validity in two senses. Construct validity, which was the aim of the regulators and the awarding bodies, and external validity or bias, which was the concern of those who believed that the process was especially biased against students living in deprived social circumstances. In all that debate about validity, there was almost nothing about what the OSR called irreducible intrinsic variation in the review that Emily talked about. That was published in March this year. And my main conclusion this afternoon will be that any bias from the algorithm was no greater than the assessment in normal years and was only partly corrected, in fact, by reverting to teacher based predictions or assessments. And the debate that happened last year almost entirely ignored the question of variation of several fundamental kinds, especially the variation that arises from the uniqueness of each individual students. Now, what I'm going to say this afternoon, I've had to depend entirely on published results from the Scottish Qualifications Authority and various other uh, bodies. I'm going to mention this again, but it seems to me one of the very unfortunate aspects of this entire situation is that as far as I know, no statistician has yet had access, no independent statistician has yet had access to individual level data suitably anonymized. And there's even only partial access to the algebra and coding of the algorithms, but I'll come back to that. Now, the results in Scotland were announced on the 4th of August by the Scottish Qualifications Authority, usually referred to as the SQA. That's both the awarding body and the assessment regulator in Scotland. When the results were first announced, the main theme of criticism was that there was bias against schools where attainment had been below average in the past five or so years, exactly as Cahill and Emily have referred to elsewhere. In practice, of course, that meant bias against schools serving mainly socially deprived neighbourhoods. And that criticism, that political criticism, came from every point of view on the political spectrum. Here's, I'll give you a few quotations. Mary Black, who's a member of the Scottish National Party, and therefore the governing party in Scotland, MP at Westminster, said that students from deprived areas saw their results reduced from their protected grades to, at a higher rate than those who were from wealthier, wealthier areas. Ian Gray, who was a Labour member of the Scottish Parliament, in fact, their education spokesperson, said that the SQA have marked the school, not the pupil, baking in the attainment gap. That phrase, baking in the attainment gap, became quite current. From the right of the political spectrum, the Daily Telegraph said this, pupils and parents from the poorest areas questioned whether their background was behind their lower than expected um, results. Of course, that what was being referred to here was the adjustment which the algorithm had made to the grades which the teachers had estimated. Most of the emphasis, as in these quotations, was on this, what the algorithm did to teachers and by implication what the algorithm allegedly did to students. But logically, of course, at that point it could equally have been because teachers had it wrong, as this Times comment uh, perceptively noted. Grade inflation by teachers was particularly pronounced for pupils from the poorest neighbourhoods, and they required the biggest adjustment by the moderators. Now, that was on the 4th of August, and then, as both Carl and Emily have noted, this Scottish controversy then spilled over to the rest of the UK and Ireland, even before the results were 
declared there. And the focus groups that the OSR report in their report uh, noted a shift in the views, as Emily has said, from general concerns about the process to focusing on the potential risks to the focus group members' individual children. So that is the OSR uh, conclusion. Now, before looking into the evidence relating to these debates, I'll briefly describe what the SQA did. It's fundamentally, I think, similar to the rest of the UK and indeed the original intention in Ireland, although there are important differences. In, in particular, it's fundamentally relevant to all of these areas because of what the Irish Times actually described for the Irish um, proposals at the time as relating to histor historical school data. So that's the key thing, saying the original intention and the algorithms to build in historical school data. The SQA announced its method last year on the 20th of April 2020, and that remained the essence of its adjustments. Teachers had to submit estimates for each individual student into very detailed bands, which is here in the column headed refined band. Teachers, in fact, have to predict student grades every year as the basis of appeals after the normal awarding process in August. And so they do have experience of predicting into the second column here, which is just called band. But the problem is, of course, the subdivision of these originally nine bands into the 19 bands show here, shown here meant that many teachers felt this was absolutely impossible to operate, especially since they had to rank order students within each of these bands and ties were strongly deprecated, which in practice actually became almost impossible for teachers um, to do. Then after the teachers did this, they submitted their rank ordering in each of these bands to the a Scottish Qualifications Authority. The SQA then imposed its moderation and the principles on which the moderation was based are summarised on this slide. It would be based on an analysis of each school's estimates last year to prior overall attainment in the school to the school's normal progress statistics from mid-secondary to senior secondary, for example, that wouldn't be available for the mid-secondary um, moderation, and the grade distributions nationally. There was also, at that point in the spring, an intention to build in the school's recent record in predicting achieved grades. Now, that last point was left ambiguous, but seemed to be conceded at that time in April and May by the relevant government minister in Scotland, John Swinney, in an interview with the Times Education Supplement on the 21st of April. And it was also conceded by the chief executive of the SQA, Fiona Robertson, when she appeared before a Scottish parliamentary committee on the 1st of uh, May. Now, the reason this last point mattered is that the accuracy or otherwise of teachers' estimates came to be at the heart of the controversies in Scotland as elsewhere. Much later, in fact, only after the results were published on the 4th of August, although this could have been published before then, but only after the 4th of August, the SQA published historical evidence from the last five years on how accurate teacher estimates had normally been. These are routinely available, unlike, for example, the situation that Carl described in, in Ireland. And here's an extract from that. This illustrates the, 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 the comparison of the teacher estimates and the achieved grades for National 5, which you can think of as roughly the kind of top half of the GCSE distribution um, in, in, in England. The graph compares teacher estimates um, in blue with the achievement in red uh, for two criteria. One is passes, that's grades A to C, and the second down at the bottom right there is achieving grade A, and it shows it according to the neighbourhood deprivation of the students in, 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 in the school. So so-called Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which I'll be referring to a lot. So SIMD is the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which divides a, dep a, a complex deprivation index into five equal parts. The teacher estimates, as you can see, were historically quite good for passes. That's the top left graph there. But they underpredicted at A. The blue bars are lower than the red bars. In fact, overall grades, the, the, the rate of teacher accuracy in Scotland was about just under 50 percent. In fact, as Emily cited also for the other parts of the UK. So, in fact, the original intention, the original intention of the algorithmic adjustment was actually to protect students against the normal pessimism of teachers, the normal tendency for these blue bars at the bottom right to be lower than the red bars. And I should say, of course, that the, the red bars in this slide are the, on the basis of real assessment and real exams and so on. However, whatever the intentions of the SQA, the controversies about all this developed during the spring last year, preparing the ground for the allegations of bias that I have quoted from the results day on the 4th of August. Particularly assiduous in this regard, I should say, was a Green member of the Scottish Parliament, Ross Greer, who was their education spokesperson. And this is 
the typical of the questions that he pressed over and over again without really getting any satisfactory answer. He said on the 6th of May, using historical school level results makes it more likely that a pupil in a working class community will have their grade lowered and a pupil in a middle class community will have their grade raised. Should point out, of course, that Greer was saying this um, a good three months before uh, the actual results appeared. The SQA then stored up further trouble for itself by seeming to promise to consult schools when there was any significant divergence between the teacher estimates and the moderated results. But they then abandoned that promise on the 30th of June after everybody had gone on holiday in exhaustion. The SQA had nothing like the consultation that Ofqual did in England or that quali Qualifications Wales did there. The SQA did not release details of the algorithm then or now, unlike Ofqual, who has at least put the algorithmic code online. And the SQA has not given researchers access to anonymized data to analyze the effects of the algorithm. Now, I'm sure we'll discuss uh, that failure to be sufficiently candid later. Um, it underlies what the OSR referred to, what Emily quoted as saying, the lack of uh, professional statistical consensus. So all we have to go on to assess the, 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 the outturn of this whole process of development and controversy is the SQA's own equality impact assessment, which was published with the results on the 4th of August. Now, this graph is one way of representing the effects of the algorithmic adjustments. This is an adapted version of a graph that appears in the SQA's equality impact assessment. It places the adjustments in the context going back to 2016, and it shows the percentage of presentations at National 5, remember that's mid-secondary, which resulted in a pass according to the neighbourhood deprivation of the candidates, comparing each of these with the category of least deprivation. So, for example, if we take the left-hand end of this thing here, um, the red bar corresponds to students living in the most deprived circumstances, comparing their results with the uh, uh, pass rate uh, among students living in the least deprived circumstances. So, the least deprived pass rate was 86%. The pass rate in the red group here, the most deprived, was 71%. If that gives a, 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 a percentage point difference of minus 15. So, that's why all these are minuses, because they're all compared with the most socially advantaged group. The second from right block on this slide is the distribution of teacher estimates in 2020. And then the final block, the right hand block here, is the distribution after the application of the algorithm. So we're not yet at what was given to the students, but it is in fact the comparison that, between the teacher estimates and the algorithm that I want to focus on. And it's immediately evident here on this additive metric of the percentage point difference that the adjustment to the most deprived categories is greater than the adjustment to the less deprived categories. That's at the mid-secondary level, and then we see a very, very similar pattern actually at the senior secondary level, the higher grade exams, the, the, the Scotland's main preparation for university um, entry. If anything, there's an even bigger disparity. But of course, fo focusing on an additive metric when we're comparing proportions is almost bound to show a bias of this kind and that is precisely what the controversies in England did in, in August in August did the controversies in August simply referred to the difference the percentage point difference in the percentage for example that would have been predicted to have a pass by the teacher compared to the percentage that the algorithm uh, did a more appropriate way of comparison of proportions is by means of the ratios of the adjustments uh, there's other ways as two that I'll come on to, shown here for National 5. So you can see that, for, again, we're, do, we're talking about the difference between each deprivation category and the least deprived category. The, for example, if we take the most deprived group at the bottom of this slide, uh, that difference according to the teacher estimates was 7.8 percentage points. The algorithm made it 13.1 percentage points, and the ratio of these two figures is 1.68. And what we can now see, in fact, is that the ratio of the algorithm's comparison with the least deprived group and the teacher's comparison with the least deprived group is remarkably similar, or about round about 1.7. There's certainly no evidence here of a particularly um, observed bias against the most deprived students. The same is true if we look at the senior secondary level at higher level um, as well on this slide. But of course, the most statistically defensible, respectable thing to do is to do it in terms of odds ratios, comparing the reference category with each of the others, the reference category again being the least deprived students, transforming that into an approximately linear scale by taking logarithms. So the next couple of slides is going to show the logarithm of the odds ratios of the comparison between each of these four deprivation groups and the least deprived group. <laughs> 
here it is for National 5, mid-secondary level. And first of all, if you look at, uh, we've got 2016 to 2019, which again, as the previous slides, is the original, the original results. Then we've got for 2020, the teacher estimates. And then at the right hand end, we've got the algorithmic results. And along the bottom, which I've referred to underneath the graph as the standard deviation of the logarithm. The odds ratios is a simple calculation, a simple index, if you like, of the inequality present in each of these uh, systems. Now, the log odds are more stable than the percentage point differences. The teacher estimates do show a somewhat tighter distribution than the recent years. That standard deviation at the bottom is 0.22 compared, for example, with 0 0.29 in 2019. But the adjusted results by the algorithm at the very right hand end of the bottom row, 0.24, is really very similar to that crude index of inequality going back to 2016. The algorithm if anything, but it's not really, it's more or less, is, is less, it's certainly more or less in line actually with the previous um, years. If the algorithm, in other words, was biased against students living in poor circumstances, it was no more biased than the normal recent functioning of these assessments. That's mid-secondary, and then we can reach a very similar conclusion for senior secondary. Now, of course, the headlines for which I quoted at the beginning, concentrated on what had happened to the teacher estimates. And adjustments downwards were routinely described in the controversies last August as adjusting students' attainment downwards. So the policy response by politicians was to abandon the algorithm and revert to teacher judgments, except perversely, where the algorithm had, had adjusted them upwards, which was about 7% of all uh, cases. But that's specious. In fact, we can go further and see that teachers in 2020 were just as much influenced by the school's history as the algorithm. And that's what I'll do in the next two slides. To do this, I've used tables of the percentage attainment in each public sector school since 2017. This isn't available for the independent schools. Now, because there are no published league tables in Scotland, I have had to compile this data from a thing called the School Information Dashboard, the Scottish School Information Dashboard. And I'm going to do it for two criteria. For each school in Scotland, the percentage of students gaining at least five awards at National 5, and similarly, the percentage of students gaining at least five awards at higher grade. I say awards rather than passes because this information dashboard only includes awards. So that's A to D rather than just A to C. Uh, the total percentage of the cohort gaining that these two thresholds uh, in the bottom row of the table, 68% for the mid-secondary level, 40% for the senior secondary uh, level, these figures would be about six or seven points lower if we were doing passes rather than awards, but that's all we have from the published data. And the table shows the Pearson correlation coefficients between adjacent years in these school level percentages. You get very similar values of patterns rather if you use a Spearman rank order correlation. The 2020 data now, are, unlike the previous slides, are for the eventual outcomes, which remember means mainly the teacher estimates. So that's what was awarded to the students after the controversies, after the abandonment of the algorithm and the reversion to the teacher estimates. So this tells us something about how consistent with the school's recent history the teacher estimates were. And what we can say from this is that the school, the teachers were remarkably consistent with how the schools had recently been. The year-to-year -year correlations at the school level are very similar up to 2019 to what it was between 2019 and 2020. A little bit less for National 5, a little bit more for, um, for higher. In other words, the order of schools produced by the teacher estimates in 2020 resembled that in 2019 just as closely as any two adjacent years resemble each other. What's more, the correlation of these measures with the school's level of deprivation was also very stable. If we look at this slide here, this is now correlating the measure I had on the, the two measures I had on the previous slide with the proportion of the students in the school who were from the most deprived area, SIMD1, um, as I referred to in the previous slide. So this is a kind of measure of the negative correlation between the school level percentage of people getting an award at a particular level and the deprivation of the catchment area of the school, roughly speaking. Again, we can see that the, what happened in 2020 
when this correlation was almost entirely the product of teachers assessing students, what happened in 2020 was completely consistent with what has been happening in the last five or six years, which is a very slow um, downward uh, reduction in inequality, a very slow weakening of, of that correlation, but still pretty uh, strong. So if the algorithm baked in inequality, as the critics alleged last August, then so also did the teachers when they were reverted to after that controversy. If we have to use this language, then the supposed saviors of the students were as unintentionally biased against poor students as the SQA's algorithm. Now, of course, it's not in fact that teachers are biased. Because I actually showed you earlier that they were rather good at predicting passes and that their, 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 their failure on individual grades was, was, was not systematic in any particular way. The inequality, of course, that's measured on a slide like this has its sources beyond the school in poverty with all the very many ways in which that damages children's educational progress. But the key point here is that this inequality long predated the algorithm and was equally seen in the teacher estimates in last August. So let me move to a conclusion now by saying what was not discussed. In all the debate about bias, there was almost no attention paid to random variation except at the school level in Scotland. The only random component that was allowed was in the tolerance levels around the constraints to each school's history. That's why I've highlighted that in, in red. And even then, there was an implicit assumption that the variability among schools in 2020 would be the same as the variability around schools in the previous three years. Now, not trying to model the random effects arising from occasions or from markers or from test items might be thought to be valuable because that's noise. That's the kind of thing we would normally want to get rid of. But of course, not measuring them biases everything else. For example, the school variation here is confounded with marker variation when the markers are mainly the students' own teachers. That's also true of variation relating to occasions and to items if the type and amount of evidence varies among schools as it certainly did last year. And even more importantly, the random effect that is the residual variation among students is where the uniqueness of each individual student lies. That's not noise in our awarding system, it's actually information. Variation among students is noise only if we are trying to build a model of student achievement in terms of things like social class or gender or something like that. Individual variation is not noise when the purpose of the model is to estimate the attainment of individuals. Now that point was captured in this comment that the that Cambridge assessments made in their evidence to the House of Commons committee in September that the, an example of the problem was high performing pupils in large, typically poor performing schools. The OSR similarly concluded that too much confidence, and Emily has said this already actually, too much confidence was placed in the ability of statistical models to predict a single grade for each individual on each course while also maintaining standards and not disadvantaging any groups. Teachers probably did that better, and it's for that reason that the reversion to teacher estimates was probably on the whole a good thing to have done. And the failure therefore of the SQA to fulfill its promise abandoned on the 30th of June to consult with schools on adjustments that were large prevented the kind of insight into individual uniqueness that only teachers could have brought to the debate. Unfairness to individuals was interpreted always in the debate last August as unfairness to categories of individuals, for example, defined by social class or ethnicity or a few other characteristics. And that is indeed part of what we might define to be the unfairness to individuals. But the uniqueness of individuals was almost entirely absent from that debate. When the algorithm was abandoned and those supposed sociological biases were removed, the debate about individual uniqueness then completely vanished, even though it was actually still present despite having allowed for certain perceived biases of a sociological kind. Perhaps, of course, there weren't any more individual level randomness remaining. 
But we can only tell that if we get access to the individual level data. And in the absence of that, it seems reasonable to suppose that there has that last year there were lots of individual variation that should have deserved uniquely individual awards and which were just smoothed out by all the processes. So let me finish then. Two completely different points were confused, I think, in the arguments last August and still are now. One was the untypical student who might excel despite circumstances, or indeed who might fail despite propitious circumstances. And the second point was the stability of school results from year to year, which in turn is a stable correlation with socioeconomic status. Nearly all the debate was about the second of these, and that's what I've summarized today. When the algorithm produced the pattern that it did, it merely confirmed this, this stability and that socioeconomic correlation. The SQA and the other awarding bodies inadvertently shaped the controversy by making the comparison in their published documents with teacher estimates. And it thus gave a convenient option to the politicians to get out of the mess. But in reality, the teacher estimates also confirmed the stability of relative school results and the stability more or less of the socioeconomic correlation. Neither the awarding bodies, nor the regulators, nor the politicians paid any attention at all to the uniqueness of individual students, which is what an assessment system is supposed to be all about. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, very interesting to see and, and fascinating to realise that Scotland has actually been able to assess the accuracy of, of teachers' grades. Have we got any questions? So again, Tom asking, are politicians realistically going to be able to hold this sort of system to account? Or is further um, regulation needed? Yes, well, um, I should say, by the way, that the regulators I referred to a minute ago were not, of course, the OSR has done a marvellous job of regulating the statistics. It's the regulators of the examination systems of qual, SQA, qualifications, Wales and similar bodies. Um, it, it seems to me that the problem here is the the sheer complexity of what we're talking about, but also, I'm afraid, the, sh the low level of statistical understanding amongst most of those in charge. The, 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 it, we live in a world in which it, the, the automatic response to anything is to look for an explanation in terms of sociological categories. I should say this is made brilliantly in the book, a book a, the most recent book by Daniel Kahneman, Oliver Saboni and Cass Sunstein, just called Noise, a book I would thoroughly recommend, just published about a month ago. And they made this point that we have a human instinct to look for explanations and these explanations are in terms of what we as statisticians would call um, categorical variables or, or, or sometimes continuous variables. In other words, variables that essentially are an attempt to to represent human experience in terms of collective groups. Now, of course, for many, many purposes, that is exactly what we need to do, especially if we're trying to find policies that overcome the effects of these collective, for example, reduce the effect of ethnicity or social class. But ultimately, that, that approach is useless when the key thing is the uniqueness of an individual person, in this case, an individual student. And unfortunately, I don't think that the failure to the failure to, to, to understand what statistical models do paradoxically then pushes people who don't understand that into thinking far too crudely in terms of explanations relating to categories rather than explanations relating to individuals. Thank you. Kaha? Yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, will we? Will, do you think we'll ever get the uh, micro data? <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, w well, that's a really good question. I mean, people have been trying to get it. I think it would probably, understandably, have to be in a secure setting of some kind because clearly it's it's going to be highly identifiable. But I, I don't. I, I think that at the moment that the exams regulators are hiding behind the the the, the risk of identification and either don't know or are unwilling to recognize the enormous advantage in secure location analysis that has have happened in the last few years. So there's no reason why we shouldn't get the individual level data. In fact, there's no reason why it shouldn't be available routinely from year to year, um, but anon suitably anonymized with the suitable ethical safeguards around a safe setting. Um, of course, that, that answer doesn't answer your question. Um, I, I don't think so, no, <laughs> because it's too, it's, it's too potentially explosive, I'm afraid. Yeah, so, I mean, I got some access. I had to go down to Athlone, which is where the exam ah, kind of court right. centre yeah. is in, in the centre of the country. Yeah. Uh, got to see some of it. And, and what struck me and struck the statisticians there as well is that in principle, 
you know, this is a very interesting problem. Uh, yes. But yes. In, in practice, of course, we're just not going to get access to it. No. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you try and write down a model um, of what you would require to estimate the results of an individual person, I mean, you could do it. You could construct a fancy piece of algebra, which is a multi-level cross-classified um, a Bayesian posterior estimate of of the of the person level residual, but of course you would require massive amounts of data to be able to estimate the parameters of that model in any kind of reliable way at all. So in fact you couldn't do it. It's actually an impossible task. <laughs> it cannot be done. <laughs> actually, I think. And as you say, the noise is a big factor as well. Of yeah. course. So noise is yeah yeah noise That's is yeah. 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 people yeah. think we can predict more than we can. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. I yes. Think Peter yeah, see, Peter's got a question. Peter, do you want to put your hand up? Uh, sorry, OK, you put it in the conversation was about fairness of. Peter, do you want to say your question or do you want me to read it out? <laughs> Interesting to note that the conversation was all about the fairness of the awarded grades and not that the variation by SM uh, by deprivation is so large. My question is, if the SQA makes available individual level data, mm. would modeling of the residual heterogeneity um, be an obvious first choice to predict grades? That's, an, that's a really interesting question. You're right, by the way, is the, 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 the enormous, I mean, you know, the, the sheer size of the inequality, which is evident in that historical data series, even going back just five years, was is the most striking thing. And, and the fact that actually the algorithm did quite well in reproducing that inequality, which as a model we would take, you know, if we did our training analysis on the on the 2015 to 19 data and then tested out that tr that on a, on, a, on, a, on a test data set, namely 2020, we'd conclude that it was doing quite well. Um, but anyway, that well, that missed it. Um, yes, the residual heterogeneity might well be a a way of a first approximation, but then you would have to you would have to adjust for all sorts of things. For example, all the other sources of variation other than the individual student. So the marker variation, the occasional va the occasion variation, the item, in other words, the assessment item variation. In a sense, that's what's going on this year, and. I don't see any suggestion, I'm afraid, that, that the normal randomness of these processes is going to be incorporated into the awards that are going to be made this summer. It's assumed that they are done with absolute certainty. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Jane, for reading the question out. Sorry, I couldn't get my microphone on. It. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Peter, I'm going to leave it to you now to uh, introduce David Hand, if that's all right. Indeed. Um, David, <laughs> I'm having difficulty following the uh, conversation today because I've had all sorts of problems with my uh, connection, as you can see. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to proceed, David, if that's OK. That, that's perfect. Can you hear me all right? Uh, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Right. Can you hear me? Indeed. Uh, great. OK, then no. I'll, I'll, I'll just get on with it. First thing I'm Good. going to try to do is share my screen. Oh, there it is. And launch my presentation. So now you should see my title slide. Can you confirm that before I continue? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Great. OK, thank you. I, I was um, very struck by Lindsay's last point about uh, basically individual differences between people. And we're getting more emphasis in medicine at the moment on the recognition that uh, treatments may work on average but hardly anybody is average <laughs> everybody is almost certainly different from average and what we're really interested in knowing is uh, the potential effect of a treatment on an individual anyway that was a by the by let me begin by saying wow <laughs> what great talks uh, the first three talks have been they've been tremendous i've really enjoyed them and i'm afraid we're going to go downhill from now on um, I assumed that the previous speakers would basically cover the sort of details of, of what, has, what has happened last year. Um, and, and indeed they have done, and I didn't want to replicate what they'd done. So I thought I'd try to approach things from a, a slightly different direction and talk about things which didn't overlap. Um, uh, 
I think I've succeeded to some extent, although I have to say that one of my slides is almost identical to one of Lindsay's, so I haven't succeeded 100%. So I want to start by saying that I had a, a strong sense of deja vu when the exams controversy blew up. It took me back some 30 years, over 30 years, to discussions about the relative merits of bank managers versus formal statistical methods in assessing credit worthiness in the consumer banking sector. This was a similar sort of controversy, not quite as pointed um, for various reasons, which were pretty obvious really, but a bit similar sort of issues. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that later on, but first I wanted to note that the title of this meeting is Was Statistical Accuracy Sacrificed to Gain Public Acceptance? And I'm going to argue that the short answer is yes. In general, subjective human judgment of likely student outcomes is not as predictive as statistical methods. So if you abandon the latter in favour of the former, you are sacrificing statistical accuracy. But there are subtleties, there are nuances, and this is basically what we've been hearing about today. So that it doesn't necessarily mean that the choice was a bad one, and when the context and all the relevant factors are taken into consideration, you can see that. So I imagine, for example, that all of you are familiar with the old adage that the best is the enemy of the good. And a nice example of that, for consultant statisticians anyway, is the choice between, on the one hand, a, a simple model finished in time to do the client's business some good, and on the other hand, a sophisticated, perhaps optimal model finished long after the client's lost interest. Um, in the present context, obviously, it wasn't time that was the elephant in the room, as it is there, but public acceptability. So I'm going to step right back to the beginning and say, what's an algorithm? And here's a definition, the Oxford English Dictionary definition of an algorithm. It's a process or a set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations. And then the dictionary adds as a sort of afterthought, especially via computer. It doesn't have to be by a computer, but obviously in our current context it was. And these sorts of ideas, these sorts of processes, algorithms are ubiquitous. They're very widely used in society. A cooking recipe is an algorithm. You take a an, in, an ingredient, you process it in some way according to some clearly defined instructions. You do the same for another, in, another ingredient. You add them in a certain way, a certain weight, stir them, mix them, do whatever you do. Put them in the oven for a certain length of time at a certain temperature and something exquisite emerges from the other end, if you're lucky. But it's an algorithm. Likewise, a formula for a manufacturing process is an algorithm. algorithm. It's a sequence of steps that you have to go through. It's a process to produce a finished outcome. Calculating a credit score that I, I mentioned earlier is a similar sort of thing. You measure a number of things on the applicant or ask them to fill in an application form or look at their previous behavior, and then you combine those items of information according to certain rules and produce a finished score. Medical diagnosis is exactly the same sort of thing. You, you identify symptoms, you, um, you carry out tests on the patient and then combine those in various ways to produce a, a, a categorical, categorical outcome. Speech recognition systems are also algorithms. They are hidden within a computer and that's quite important because some of these algorithms are latent or behind the scenes. But after all this, where do we get to? Well, an exam is an algorithm. And the truth is that algorithms pervade the usual method through which we assign grades, something which I think was lost during this discussion last year. The total exam mark, for example, is calculated by summing component marks. The marks will be standardized and adjusted in various ways, sometimes through quite complex sub-algorithms of their own, like piecewise linear transformations, things we're all familiar with, but in general one can't expect all of the public to be familiar with. Modules module marks are weighted before they are combined. So quite an elaborate algorithm to produce final grades or scores. Grade boundaries are set by a formal method and so on. And there are reasons that this, these complicated algorithms apply in ordinary everyday examinations, which is that the aim is to produce a fair process and to ensure that the, the result properly measures what it's supposed to measure. And I thought I'd give a, a little example to show how complex and some of these can be and what sort of things need to be taken into account by looking at 11 plus scores. Um, in 11 plus scores, standardization occurs. It's a statistical process. 
And it's designed to take account of two factors. The first is balancing different components. So the example that I got from this document was the number of questions on the test paper and the time allowed for it can differ. It says, gives the example of verbal reasoning test, which might have 80 questions and takes 50 minutes, contrasted with a maths paper with 100 questions and 45 minutes. And you've got to combine them in some way to produce an overall score. Secondly, the test scores need to be adjusted in some sense to take account of the age that the, that the children come into the school. There could be almost a year's difference between the ages at which children come into the same year of school. And at the sort of ages we're talking about, very young ages, a year's difference has a huge impact on vocabulary and socialization and so on. So it can have a huge impact. So the 11 plus needs to be adjusted in some way to take account of that. And I have to say, academics here will know this, but if you think that's complicated, have a look at the marks adjustment process for university exams and degree classes. Uh, you might be enlightened or perhaps horrified, I don't know. Okay. So that was algorithms in the exam context, a sort of quick view overview of that. Now let's look at the other side. Let's look at teacher prediction of exam grades. Well, one paper I came across said only 16% of applicants achieved the A-level grade points they were predicted to achieve. There might be reasons why that's so low, but yeah. Um, it said 75% of applicants were over-predicted. That, that seemed to um, contrast with what Lindsay was saying. It'd be interesting to compare the two sources. Um, so what are the problems? Well, Again, uh, I'm afraid this is repeating what we've heard, especially from, from Lindsay. One problem is variance. There is irreducible variation between grades due to variation between a number of things. One is markers. Different markers behave in different ways. Another is occasions. This is a slide which uh, closely matched one of Lindsay. Um, occasions, if an exam was to take place at a different time, well, all sorts of circumstances might, might intervene to produce a different um, grades, even if other things were equal. The test details, Lindsay put items there, but that's the sort of thing I meant. If you ask a specific set of questions to a student, well, maybe the student's specially prepared for that set of questions, whereas if you asked uh, another equally legitimate set covering slightly different parts of the material, you might get a different result and so on. And then on the other hand, we have bias. So uh, scorers and so on, markers will Obviously, it are making subjective decisions. They may be subconscious. Conceivably, they're not, but they will generally be subconscious. They may also be subject to perverse incentives. The teacher reputation, you know, a teacher who said, well, I think all my students are going to fail, may not be in a job for very long. And likewise, um, at a higher level, we get the same sort of perverse incentive from school league tables, which, of course, are devised using another algorithm. Uh, I think A-level grade inflation um, illustrates some of these sorts of phenomena. And there's an analogy um, with what goes on in science in general, where there's very clear publication bias favoring sort of exciting new results, uh, and which may well have a, then a higher probability of subsequently being retracted. Um, okay, so I've said something about algorithms in the exam process. I've said something about teacher predictions of likely outcomes. Let's look at the advantages of formalization through algorithms. Well, one is you ensure uniformity in reaching decisions. You know, you've written down the algorithm, you know how it works, and you're applying it to every student. Um, it's also a way of making, of, of making decisions more efficient. You can handle a very large number of cases. Clearly, this sort of thing applies in schools where you've got lots and lots of students. And it applies in the other example that I mentioned, credit scoring, where you had millions of people applying for credit all, all the time. Um, another advantage is um, transparency. You, you know exactly what has been done. You've actually got the algorithm written down. You are not relying on subjective sort of assessment. You know what data has been used. You know how it has been combined, whether things have been added, whether they've been, been transformed before adding and so on. And that, of course, means that you can incrementally improve algorithms. You can experiment with adding other variables, transforming things in other ways, combining things in different ways, and so on. But underlying all this is that you need to be very clear about what you want to know. And this has been touched on by, by other speakers. 
we need to decide whether we are trying to predict the award, the, the award grades the candidates would most likely have achieved had they sat the exam, the sort of counterfactual, or perhaps had the pandemic not occurred, because those two things might be different, or indeed, perhaps we're trying to determine a, stu a student's understanding, knowledge and ability. And the bottom line, that's really what we're interested in. But of course, the uh, process put in place next year was perhaps not aiming to do that. It was try uh, trying to award the grade the candidates most likely would have achieved. So There's um, extensive evidence of superiority of formal methods over human judgments in a variety of areas. Um, but there are nuances, there are subtleties. One of the earliest researchers who did a lot of work in this area and his work is often cited is Paul Meal working in the 1950s. In fact, I got papers on this going back to the 1920s, although which, which was clearly very much before the uh, computer era. Um, but Paul Meal has done did fundamental work on this. Uh, here's a quote from one of his papers, given a, a data set about an individual or a group, He's talking about two modes of data combination. On the one hand, human judgment. He's talking about psychological diagnosis here, psychiatric diagnosis. And on the one, he says, you've got the clinical method, which is human judgment, our teacher judgment. And on the other, we've got the mechanical method, an algorithmic objective procedure. And the bottom line is empirical comparisons of the accuracy of the two methods show that the mechanical method, the algorithmic method, is almost invariably equal to or superior to the clinical method based on comparing with known outcomes. In other contexts, here's a quote. Um, this is um, concerned with applicants for jobs. Uh, it says people trust that the complex characteristics of applicants can be best assessed by a sensitive, equally complex human being, teacher assessment. It says this does not stand up to scientific scrutiny. Paul Meal again of 136 research studies, not more than 5% show the clinician's informed predictive procedure to be more accurate than the statistical one. Uh, this paper, um, credit scoring, um, the bank introduced an automated credit scoring process, compared it um, with uh, a loan officer's expert judgment, teacher assessment, and analysis of the costs and benefits of the credit scoring system strongly suggests that the bank's cost of lending decreased substantially. And there's a lot, there were a lot of comparisons of this, uh, uh, this sort of thing a few decades ago, coming to the, the same conclusion as this. And also noting the point I made earlier that you can incrementally improve these formal algorithms. I want to say a little bit about two kinds of different comparisons, because this is in some sense fundamental to what's going on here. The first is what data are available. Um, on the one hand, and the sort of a lot of the comparisons are, are, that, that I've sort of illustrated a moment ago are typically based on presenting the same data to the human and machine. So you've got your table of data, your particular set of attributes which have been measured. You give it to the person and you say, look, this describes the, the patient, the applicant, the student, whatever. And on the other hand, you give it to the algorithm. A very rigidly constrained sort of process. And real life is not quite like that. Humans often have access to other data. For example, they might, in the medical context, notice that a patient is very flushed. Or you might know that a student had suffered a bereavement just prior to the exam. And that, of course, can influence the um, a teacher assessment in a, in a positive, constructive way. OK, let me take a higher uh, sort of context now. The social context. This is the context of public understanding, the, the issue which underlay the controversy, if you like, the public understanding, transparency and the ethical constraints. So let me give an example. For default risk in credit scoring, obviously, if I'm running a financial organization, I will want to build the most predictive model I can for default risk. Who's going to default? Who isn't going to default? And that's also going to be beneficial to the potential customer, because if they're going to overstretch themselves, I don't want to give them the money. So you need to know what's going on. You want to build the most predictive model you can. And that, of course, applies to all of the areas that I'm talking about, including um, student assessment. You want to build the most predictive model you can. So obviously, you're going to use all the information you can. You're going to use all the characteristics of the applicant that you can on an application form, past behavior, whatever. Does that mean we should include disability, sex, race, religion, and so on? You'll recognize these as protected characteristics. We don't include those. We are prohibited from including those for reasons beyond simple classification accuracy. There are ethical constraints. 
similarly choosing between job applicants. You might discover through analysing data that type of font is predictive of whether people will do well in a job. But should you include that in your assessment? Let me come to this other point which has been stressed, the importance of human, human oversight and an appeals process. This is important because humans have wider perceptions and deeper understanding of what's going on, which means they can act as a screening and an assurance process, an appeals process to allow for anomalies and unusual cases. But, and here's a little example, um, again from the credit scoring area, uh, a tycoon whom we know to be very wealthy might just have arrived in this country, but of course has no UK credit record. So finds he or she can't get a bank loan. A human assessing this, a bank manager assessing this, uh, will be will be able to see what's going on and, and, and sort it out appropriately. So that's why human, where, if you like, humans have an advantage, anomalies and unusual cases. The appeals process is important of that. But it doesn't always work. Here's a counter example that you'll be familiar with. The, uh, a year or two ago, the Boeing 737 MAX crash, where humans and machines fought for control uh, over the aircraft. The algorithm was saying, do this. Humans were saying, do something else. OK, so let me talk about A-level, come to you know, the conclusion what this meeting is about, the A-level grade algorithms in the pandemic context. The problem, one of the problems was limited and heterogeneous training data for the supervised approach. We hadn't sort of gone back in time and built models based on all of the data which we would need to build these models. The other speakers have illustrated this. There were time pressures, other speakers have, just, have, have spoken about that. And then of course there were external constraints. This um, requirement in England certainly to have the same overall grade distribution as, as in previous years. And of course, there are tensions between constraints, for example, between accuracy and ease of explanation. That's a, a, a common one. But you'll also be familiar with a sort of comparative thing in other areas of um, accuracy on the one hand and avoiding discrimination on the other. Relating back to my point about protected characteristics, you, you will be aware that there are many different definitions of fairness. And you can show mathematically that you can't satisfy all of them. They're sort of logically contradictory. And of course, then there were unrealistic expectations. Um, we need, for example, people needed to recognise the uncertainty associated with ranks, hard cutoffs, which don't really represent what's going on. And of course, that you can't usefully rank students whose performance is very similar. Asking a teacher, well, yes, they're, they're about the same, but which one's better? Which one is likely to score higher is, is a bit unfair. And then there were um, perhaps unreasonably tough requirements, um, ethical and uh, um, example there from a different sector is driverless cars where we're holding them to a higher standard than human drivers. Any accident with a, 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 an autonomous vehicle, a driverless car hits the papers, but hardly any of the accidents involving human drivers hit the papers. So let me begin to wind up potential consequences of this controversy. Well, a higher level one is damage to public acceptability of algorithms in general and, and in, other, in, in other applications, not just the teaching application. Damage to public acceptability of the grading system. Damage to public acceptability of results in the future. People have now been sensitised to the fact that, you know, the grades, well, there's this sort of ambiv ambivalence, ambiguity, uncertainty about them. The fundamental point is also that tests test only what they test in machine learning and widespread algorithms. I describe it as we face a new kind of principal agent problem. The algorithm does exactly what you tell it to, and it does it in exactly the way you tell it to do it, even if that doesn't really perfectly align with what you really want. Because, you know, in transforming the real life question, this doesn't just apply in this context, but applying the real life real world question, transforming it into a, a mathematical numerical question inevitably involves simplifications. For example, in this context, what, what criterion was optimized when estimating the parameters? Use different criteria, you get different estimates, different performance. How does that align with what's really a concern, what you really matter with, if you can specify that really, of course? 
So I used three examples throughout this talk. The first was statistical consultancy right at the start. What you want to do is build the best model you can build. But in my illustration, you had to do that under time constraints, not just a question of best in maximum likelihood or whatever sense you want. For banking, you wanted to build the best credit scoring model you could build, but you had these constraints that you couldn't use protected characteristics. And in our context, exam result prediction, you wanted to build the best predictive model you could build, but under ill-defined constraints of public perception and acceptance. So let me summarize. My answer to this question, was statistical accuracy sacrificed to gain public acceptance, is yes, but that occurred in the context of public failure to appreciate the role of algorithms in the usual process, the superiority of formal methods at predicting outcomes, <laughs> basically the impossibility of getting it right, whatever right means. And of course, failed to take into account the inevitable huge interest at the individual personal level. Unlike credit scoring, all of these exams hit on, exam results hit on the same day. Huge amount of interest, people's futures depending upon it. But I said public failure to appreciate at the top of this slide. Perhaps public failure to appreciate really means, or is the flip side of, inadequate communication. The point is that we need to take the public with us in all of this. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was, as ever, uh, very clear, uh, very pointed in terms of the topic today. And I felt you really uh, hit the problem. I, th there's one thing that's always been troubling me throughout all of these debates today, these discussions, and that is that what we're looking at here is the difference between what a teacher produces as an estimate of somebody's knowledge, ability, etc., and what an examination produces, that's one scenario, versus what a teacher produces and uh, the public perception then is what a computer has produced. Now, in the former situation, uh, imagine the parents of that child. Um, they open the results and it's really much lower than expected, lower than predicted. And the child says, yeah, I really felt bad on that day. I didn't do well in that exam. The exam was awful, but you know, that's the way it goes. Maybe I can do a reset. Versus opening it when you know that the computer has produced the information the parental response is, well, the computers are wrong, aren't they? You know, that's it's this lack of trust yeah. in the algorithmic approach, a lack of understanding exactly as you said, in the way in which we produce these examination grades anyway. And what I see is the inherent fairness in what people were trying to do with the limited time and limited resources that they had available. Others may differ, but thank you I very much, David. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think uh, Lindsay made that point point very well. I, I think that's right. I mean, we have this free up phrase, computer error, don't we? And, mm. you know, a lot of the time it's not the computer which is a problem. It's what's being fed in or, or, or some other sort of aspect of it. But yeah, yeah. Other questions? Kevin, did you want to come in here? Oh, yeah, OK. I mean, this is really only me thinking aloud. Um, David talked about protected uh, constraints of protected characteristics in a credit scoring situation. It obviously it applies in other financial situations, all sorts of situations like that. And that led me to think, is there an equivalent in an exam situation? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a situation before the pandemic when exams were done in the way in the way there are, because it, it seems to me that there is only a very limited kind of consideration that on an individual basis anyway, um, you know, perhaps through the appeal system or or something like that. And then indirectly in universities, maybe treating people differently according to certain characteristics to allow for what they perceive as problems with the exam results. But I, I just wondered if that said anything about how the algorithms that came up last year um, should take into account protected characteristics. If exams don't, yeah, yeah. Why should why should the algorithm or, or what are the problems if the algorithm doesn't? There seems to me there are quite a few if it doesn't. I, I think that's a good point. I, I don't think the personally I don't think the exams or the algorithm should take into 
count protected characteristics. It's it's what you do with them afterwards that should. So, yeah, and, and this is what's happening around the world as well, around in the UK anyway. You know, the universities are looking at the context in which the exam result was achieved and trying to take it into account in that way. Mm. There's two kind of linked questions that have come up on the chat. One from Tom King asking whether better oversight of algorithms would be a, 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 a better approach. And the other from Tom Bradley, Bradley asking, well, asking about the use of the algorithm uh, to adjust school estimated grades of students in schools entering a very small number of students for an examination. So well, that's a very specific comment on the way the algorithm was applied. Uh, Tom's point is, I think, more general. So uh, Tom or Tom, do you want to add anything to either of what of what you've written down or what I've said? Um, yeah, this is uh, Tom Bramley. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, it was. Um, well, the question is, if an algorithm is going to be you know, command public accept does it need to be applied to everybody? Because um, one of the problems we had in England last summer was that um, the algorithm wasn't deemed to be sufficiently reliable to um, adjust the grades of students in very small schools or in very small uh, schools with very small numbers of candidates for a particular subject. So yeah. is that in, in, in and of itself a problem? And how, how could that be have been got round in this situation? That's right, and and the, the small schools were, were treated in some other way, which is which is very interesting because what it means is you're taking out certain subgroups and not subjecting them to processing by the same algorithm, so they're being treated differently, which raises issues of its own. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I, I think the, the the proper answer is that there are statistical techniques, which everybody here I'm sure is aware of to try to allow for the extra variability arising from, from small, small schools. I suppose also it has to be said, there isn't a right answer in any absolute sense. You know, maybe you've got, you've only got three kids in the school, but they're really brilliant this year, whereas last year the opposite. You know, there isn't a 100% a, a, um, right answer, but I think better algorithms um, in the sense of deeper taking more sort of uh, random effects models, whatever, uh, and so on, which other previous speakers have spoken about, um, is the right answer. Um, the question of oversight, yes, um, and I think we're moving in that direction. I belong to a group called Validate AI, which looks at validating artificial intelligence, which means algorithms, you know, uh, systems, um, to you know, and try to identify possible potential weaknesses so that you can rely on them insofar as it's possible in the future. Thank you, David. We'll take one last point before we have a break for 10 minutes. And uh, that's come uh, from Neil Spencer asking, do we know if the preliminary focus group discussions were supportive of taking the school's prior history into account? Neil. Hi. Yes, uh, but my, my point is really uh, following on from one that Lindsay Paston had made uh, slightly higher up in the chat where he was saying maybe we would have overcome a lot of the issues by not taking the school history into account. Uh, and I, th I think I'm right in uh, saying that uh, there were these focus groups that were suggesting what would be appropriate to include in the model. And so, for instance, uh, a student's private attainment would make sense to be included. Uh, I was wondering whether those focus groups were asked about where does it make sense to include this baked in history? Okay. Um, David. Okay. I, right. I don't know the answer to that. Can you ask it again in the in the in a panel discussion <laughs> in a moment? But can I just make one sort of final observation that this is we, we're never going to, never going to get everybody agreeing. There are always going to be some subgroups who disagree about whatever's been done. Um, and, and so we have this sort of concept of the public view, the public perception. There isn't any public in this context, I think. There are lots of different people and groups with different opinions. That's not an answer to your question, which, as I say, I can't answer, but ask it in the panel and maybe you'll get an answer. OK, we take a break for 10 minutes, uh, back again at five o'clock with uh, Joe Tomlinson, who's going to give us reflections on legal aspects and then we move into the panel discussion at 5.30. Assuming that uh, most people are now back from a 10 minute break and that we will um, 
progress the event further with uh, Joe Tomlinson, who is a senior lecturer in public law at the University of York. And Joe is going to give us uh, reflections on legal aspects of the exams uh, 2020 uh, debacle, I guess you would call it. So, Joe, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. I, I hope everybody can um, hear me and see my slides properly, and I assume somebody will shout if, if that's not the case at any point. Um, first of all, I'll just say thank you very much for the invite uh, to speak today. Um, the talks I've heard have been fantastic. Um, and as, a, as an academic lawyer, it sometimes feels like worlds are colliding when I attend uh, these kinds of events. The logics of different fields and specialisms uh, can really seem like they clash at times, but it's these kinds of issues that remind us why we have to speak across those disciplines uh, as much as possible um, and try to develop um, broader understanding. Um, so um, with that in mind, I thought it might be useful to set out a little bit about my background. Um, so um, I'm predominantly an academic public lawyer, so um, I'll explain a little bit uh, about public law in a moment. Um, but essentially, I'm interested in the law of the state, the law of the public sector. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking at the uh, increase in the use of algorithms in the public sector in recent years uh, and the implications of that for public law. Um, and part of my time I also spend with a legal charity, the Public Law Project, um, who um, are, are interested in ensuring that essentially public sector decision making is fair and lawful and where it's not trying to challenge uh, that decision making. Um, so in that capacity, I've been developing a more practical program of casework and training around algorithmic decision making uh, and really trying to figure out um, what public law and algorithms, um, uh, how they uh, come together in practice, once a better phrase. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, I should also mention that I'm very much an English public lawyer, so I'm going to be talking about my experience from that perspective. And um, so I'm sorry if at any point I seem parochial uh, in my comments, but that's the reason. Um, and, and what I'm going to try to offer is a general uh, reflection uh, from the point of view of a public lawyer on the exams, uh, should we call it a debacle um, last year, uh, and what, um, uh, in hindsight, it, it means for the relationship between public law and algorithms. OK, so just to introduce um, the idea of public law, which will be, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. Um, so as I said, public law is the law regulating uh, the public sector. Um, it comes in a variety of forms. So we get legislation, um, which takes general, which takes form of general and specific frameworks and, and also common law principles. So by general frameworks uh, of public law, things like the Human Rights Act, the Equality Act, et cetera, things that put general uh, duties on public authorities to act uh, in a certain way. Uh, but public law is also made up of lots of very specific uh, policy sector legislation around education, social security, uh, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, public law uh, as it exists in legislation is supplemented by common law principles, so principles that are developed by the courts um, over uh, centuries. Um, so as decisions are made, the courts develop and extend uh, sometimes refined principles. Um, those kinds of uh, an example of one of those principles um, is procedural fairness. So, for instance, the idea that in some situations when an administra administrator takes a decision uh, that affects your interest, you're allowed a fair hearing uh, against that um, decision. So the idea of public law is that through that legislation and through those common law principles, uh, we are imposing standards on public law, on public decision makers. So legal standards are being imposed on public decision makers. The traditional view of public law in the UK, at least, is that the focus is very much on procedural standards. Um, so if you were to go to a public law hearing, a judicial review case, uh, there will be a constant refrain from all the parties and the judges uh, that what we're all concerned about is um, how a decision was made and not the merits of that decision. So public law still very much focuses on how a decision is made or how a decision is reached rather than the outcome itself. Um, however, uh, some will argue that that's changing um, in recent decades and there's more of a focus on rights and substantive uh, standards. But in my view, public law is still very much procedure focus uh, to a large extent in the UK. So altogether, public law is a vast, complex body of law regulating the public sector. 
Uh, but it's really important to remember that whilst there is all this law and these standards, uh, the tradition of UK public law is to give public authorities quite a large amount of space to manoeuvre. Um, so to summarise this in really simple terms, potentially reductionist terms, uh, the UK courts are extremely deferential to public authorities, particularly when they're taking complex technical uh, decisions um, and decisions that have um, uh, potentially wide consequences. So the courts are generally quite deferential and reluctant to intervene in complex decision making that has uh, significant effects. Again, some people suggest that might be changing, but generally we still see a lot of deference in public law. In terms of where public law comes from, uh, it has deep historical origins. Um, but what we really recognise as modern public law in this country uh, originated out in the 1950s and, and, and 60s. Um, and the reason for that is that there was a massive growth in administrative power um, and there was a consensus that emerged, at least in the legal profession, in the courts, but uh, certainly more widely, um, that uh, it was important for the for there to be greater legal protections about uh, against the potential for the abuse of administrative power. Um, so the really important part of, of um, the really re the important reason for the subject for the purpose of this discussion uh, to understand the history of public law, or at least recognize it, is that when the courts were developing um, standards for public law through the common law, um, and when legislation was being written, it was often being written with the image of a human bureaucrat in mind, a, a human decision maker. So the image at the centre of, of public law is in many ways a human official. So public law meets algorithms. Um, so what does this intersection look like? Well, the truth is that public law is still very much catching up with the use of algorithms in the public sector. Um, we have not seen very many cases on algorithms in the UK um, and their use in the public sector. And, um, and this is a really interesting uh, point about how legal disputes are being handled, I think, in the UK, is that most of the claims that I'm aware of that have been brought against algorithms being used in the public sector have been settled at a fairly early stage. So um, they get resolved through um, early agreement or public authorities recognising they've made a mistake or they're going to go back and change something or reconsider something. So we're seeing a lot of settlement early on. Uh, and the upshot of, of that, or at least one upshot of that, is that we don't get judgments. So if a case is settled, we don't have a final uh, judgment where the court considers all the arguments and lays down uh, principles. Now, from one perspective, it's a good thing that um, potentially the legal system is being used to force resolution of certain issues or problems in algorithmic systems. On the other hand, um, people like me, for instance, want to see clear principles coming from the court about courts about how public law applies to algorithmic decision making. So because of the lack of judgments uh, that we have in this area, um, we're still lacking clear answers about how the law applies in relatively basic um, to relatively basic algorithms. In terms of the litigation that has occurred, the focus, um, again, this is my, my, my general sense from what I know of the cases that have been brought and settled and, and the few that have gone to hearings. Um, the general focus of the activity in the UK is immigration and welfare. Uh, and much of that litigation is involving group actors. So, for instance, there's been quite a lot of litigation around um, the automated system at the heart of uni universal credit. Um, and in the Home Office, there's been lots of um, algorithms introduced to essentially um, do things like categorise decisions um, or applications for, to, to improve the speed of decisions. Um, and, and those kinds of systems are being challenged. Um, the group actors involved tend to be NGOs, charities, different interest groups and pressure groups who are acting on behalf of, of the people who are being processed uh, by those algorithms. I, I don't think I've yet seen, um, somebody may remind me uh, of an example, but I don't think I've seen uh, a case yet where an individual has um, essentially realised they've been unfairly treated by an algorithm, brought a, a case and it's, it, it's become, it's gone into the public domain. Um, but the focus seems to be very much on NGOs actors bringing cases at the moment. Potentially the central question um, for public law in relation to algorithms in the public sector is how far the courts will go in taking those existing principles and legislative standards that we have and applying them to algorithmic decision making um, and potentially um, maybe even developing new approaches. So just to give um, an example of that, 
Um, in common law, uh, there is a, a lot, uh, not a general duty to give reasons, and so every decision by an administrator has to come with reasons. But in most circumstances, the courts will generally expect reasons to be given for an administrative decision. Um, so how a principle like that plays out in algorithmic systems potentially has lots of interesting, uh, bring, uh, raises lots of interesting issues, uh, and we simply don't have the answers to, to those questions yet. Um, so what a lot of public law academics are doing, or the public law academics interested in this at least are doing, are trying to argue about how those principles um, can translate to these kinds of um, situations, these kinds of systems. Uh, and what we're seeing as a result um, is a lot of searching for parallels going on. So um, the point that was made in the earlier presentation that algorithms are certainly not new, um, there's, it's, that pathway is being um, followed to look for previous cases where algorithmic-like systems um, are, uh, were reviewed and um, adjudicated from by the courts. Um, and lawyers are increasingly trying to seek parallels um, to, to algorithmic systems through those cases. So potentially the central question is about the substantive law and what it means for algorithmic systems. Um, but there's lots of other important legal issues around, around the edges too. Um, and I think just to give an example of that, um, the question of whether we need to change legal procedures so that algorithms can be um, better, more appropriately challenged is a really interesting uh, question, um, and it's something that the Law Commission is, is starting to take a look at. Um, so, for instance, um, are algorithms going to lead to different kinds of evidence being brought to, uh, to court for judges who are not experts in those kinds of systems to adjudicate on? Um, so do we need to potentially change our legal procedures? Um, so the intersection between public law and algorithms is still very much developing, um, and we're in this transitional uh, phase. So this brings uh, me to summer 2020 and the exams uh, fiasco. Um, so this really arrived, this um, fiasco arrived at a, mo a transitional moment for public law and algorithms. Um, so when the results uh, were released, um, in England and Wales at least, there were multiple judicial review claims, uh, public law claims brought to the courts pretty much immediately. I think one, I saw a, a letter for action, I think, pretty much the day after the results were released. I can't remember the exact date of it, but it was very, very quickly uh, the, the case that different actions were launched. Now, interestingly, the claims involve various targets. So the, the what was being um, reviewed, what was the target of the review, what the claims were essentially uh, trying to track upon uh, varied quite significantly. So some claims focused on the model, uh, some focused on the appeal system, some were more targeted on the general decision making around uh, the system. And various grounds were used. Um, so as a warning, uh, in public law cases, you tend to see quite a lot of grounds used. You have a kind of kitchen sink mentality, uh, trying to make as many arguments as, as my stick. Um, but uh, there were quite a lot of interesting arguments put in these um, uh, claim letters. So just to, to, to highlight a few, uh, there were claims about systemic procedural unfairness being made. So that system itself was systemic, systemically procedurally unfair. Um, there, was a, there were claims that the system was irrational. Um, so in public law terms, that means that no rational decision maker would ever have created uh, the system that was used. Uh, there were lots of points about statutory duties, specific statutory duties around qualifications and the responsibility of various authorities. Um, there was claims of the breach of the, uh, breach of the Equality Act because of the differential impact on people with uh, protected characteristics um, and there was also data uh, law claims so for instance breach of gdpr was claimed in various uh, claim letters so what's quite interesting about this from a legal point of view is that um, there was not one clear legal wrong uh, that was being raised there was a batch of very different grounds being raised um, and um, they varied from Different claim to claim. So, um, reflecting on um, and the case um, almost a year later, um, or the cases I should say a year later, um, I, I think um, that the sunny side first. Um, so, in many ways, um, the exams episode was an outlier case um, because it was so high profile. Uh, 
a lot of the other cases that we see being brought against um, algorithms that are arguably unfair uh, get much less attention and, and, and look very similar to the kind of algorithm and, and system that we see in, in this situation. Um, so um, arguably a good thing that there was more attention being brought to this kind of um, uh, issue. Uh, we also saw very quick moves to use um, law once the impact on students was apparent. Um, so we saw um, a, a kind of legal mobilization that was part of a, a wider political mobilization. Um, but it was the political advocacy and the protests and the fallout which ultimately led uh, to the change. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that um, it wasn't really the legal action, in my view, uh, that changed this. Uh, um, the dynamic last summer, it was very much the public reaction. Um, also interesting to note that the role of crowdfunding played, that the role that crowdfunding played in these cases. So lots of the claims that were lodged quite quickly um, were crowdfunded um, and they were brought by pressure groups such as Fox Club. So when we talk about legal cases, we can see them as dry technical things, but most of the cases in relation to the exams um, algorithm were very much campaigns where a case was one part of, uh, of the campaign. Uh, and crowdfunding was used as a mechanism not only to fund the case, but also to kind of build a network of interested people uh, and mobilize that network. So arguably, um, the, the experience um, uh, last summer um, shows potentially the, the, the importance of judicial review um, as, a, as a backstop, as a mechanism. Um, for challenging decisions um, and, and it also shows that it can be effective when combined with a, a wider policy strategy. But, but I would argue that there's also a, a, a less sunny side to what, to what we saw on the role of law in last um, summer's episode. Um, so first of all, the role of law is very much retrospective. Um, so it, it's always the case that when um, decisions are made and the impact is seen and then cases are brought, there's a sense that a lot of the issues raised in the case could have been dealt with earlier if there had been proper engagement from uh, the relevant authorities. Um, and that was certainly the case here. There was uh, a lot of the points were, were pretty apparent um, prior to results being released. Um, and it would have been better perhaps to have a more prospective conversation about various legal standards um, in, in this decision making system. Um, we also, I think, saw on full display last uh, summer the problems of access to the legal system for, for often, and particularly the courts, for those who um, need it most. Um, I, I mentioned crowdfunding um, and group litigation, and, and one of the reasons they are so prominent um, in um, judicial review at the moment is because it's so expensive uh, to bring a judicial review case in many instances um, that that's, um, th those groups and crowdfunding is relied upon to, to make up the access gap. Um, so yes, the role of law was potentially significant last summer, but also um, in, a, in the wider scheme of things, there are serious problems of access and for less high profile cases, um, potentially the problems for access will be much more severe. Um, we didn't leave this episode with lots of clarity on the application of, of, of legal principles. Um, in fact, we didn't get um, much clarity at all because of the way the cases were resolved. Um, those cases that settled, we could say there might, could have been a terrible judicial decision. I think there's, uh, I think one of the big risks in this area is that ultimately things are dragged into courts that um, and are not properly understood as part of the adversarial process and, and ultimately get bad decisions. So there's still a really big risk that that can happen here. Um, so ultimately, whilst I think the rule of law was important last summer, um, it, it remains too limited and also very unpredictable. Um, I, I, by and large, this reflects um, problems with how law into public law interrelates with algorithmic systems um, across government. So, so my final point is this, uh, and this is a, a reflection um, which comes from studying algorithms across a government and how uh, processes um, uh, relate to them. And so I'd be interested to hear um, comments and, and thoughts on, on how these points relate to uh, this particular uh, episode as well. Um, so my broader reflection is that um, we need to move from thinking about law in public sector algorithms to thinking about algorithms as part of a wider picture of administrative justice. So by administrative justice, not just thinking about law as, as rules, but thinking about how we can uh, 
make and scrutinize better rules, how we can uh, improve the accuracy of decision making and provide effective redress. So we can't take a narrow focus on the rule of law, but we have to broaden out to think about how we can create systems that um, adjust and can maintain legitimacy uh, with the public. So as part of that, I think we need to, um, and I'm speaking broadly here about the role of algorithms in the public sector, uh, we need to think about, again, about how we make and scrutinize various rules, so laws, policies, et cetera, um, that regulate algorithmic decision-making um, and how those rules can be centered in the design of systems. So not just have rules that um, are, are on the books and are in policies, but rules actually mean something to the way these systems are designed uh, in practice. Um, we need to develop a better understanding uh, of how, how algorithmic decision making can harm and help people and, and better design uh, decision making processes. Uh, and finally, um, I would say we need to focus um, also on making sure that these systems have effective redress systems. And by that, I don't just mean courts, but accessible, um, cheap, easy to use, non intimidating redress systems um, that can help not only resolve individual grievances, but improve trust uh, and legitimacy, trust in and legitimacy of uh, algorithmic systems. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but if anybody's interested in reading uh, more on uh, my work on this area, I put some, um, some citations here. And I also wanted to mention a training session that the Public Law Project is running in July, which is an introduction to how uh, the detailed areas of law, equality law, et cetera, uh, applies to algorithmic decision-making. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. That was that was that was really interesting. It it raises some quite difficult questions, though, about whether we need to do something different because of uh, what we've seen, particularly exam exemplified with the uh, examinations uh, issue problems. That, and I think as David remarked we've we've had algorithms around before we had computers um you know there's nothing new about them it's just that maybe people didn't know the word or didn't realize kind of quite what was involved um and because everything becomes more computerized now there's more of a tendency for people to say well you know computer might be wrong um anybody who's not been advantaged by a, an algorithm you can't sort of claim that that's unfair and very unlikely to claim it's unfair although uh, clearly uh, some someone else who then loses uh, is the result of that uh, un unfairness um, and I think there's a there's another issue uh, underlying all of this which is about you raise it right at the end in your last slide about um, how, how do we how do we engender trust in the systems in many of our uh, areas where we have algorithmic decision making, particularly in um, the awarding of exams in a kind of non-pandemic uh, environment, we uh, we are how can I put it? Um, lost the thread of what I'm saying. Sorry, I'm in a dreadful situation at the moment because I've got BT engineers climbing outside the house, likely to pull the plug on everything at any any moment. So 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 bear bear with me. Oh. Um, um, I'll, I'll get back to this later on. I want to turn now to uh, Bernard, who is going to lead the panel discussion. So uh, for our panelists, um, we've got uh, the the oh god i had it up a minute ago it's gone <laughs> i'm being waved at to jane um i am likely to lose this i think any second judging okay. by what's going on do you want to hand over or do you want to keep uh i'm here can you see me can you hear me hang on oh um, that's better wait a minute that's it. Ah, oh, Bernard. Hello. Hi. Now let me just get myself so I'm looking at the camera rather than looking somewhere else. Um, and um, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. I have to be 
I, you never know whether to apologize or not, but I'm going to, which is I haven't been able to listen to the discussion so far, but I have some excellent notes that have been provided, except for the last bit of Joe's talk, which is fantastic. Um, but I apologize because of multiple commitments that um, you only have me for this hour. So um, nevertheless, this is a really important um, topic. Now, I've had a question. Um, I don't know how we want to run this panel. Um, if people have questions, can they maybe put them in the chat or something like that? And then we can actually, and the trouble is, if you have put them in the chat already, I probably can't see them because I think I can only, Tom no longer has access to chat. So the, if you, if you um, can put any questions in the chat, um, that's probably the best. I've got uh -huh. one. Sorry? I think, I think um, yes, Amy, Amy's been keeping an eye on the chat, so if necessary, ask her to Well, I have, and I haven't heard anything back from her. There was one question. Oh. Um, uh, I've just was, sent you an email. Then. Ah, right, okay, it'll get to me in a moment. Um, so as soon as that arrives, ah, I have to reset my system. Yeah, that's right, we had, and the other problem was I came online rather a while ago. Amy, is the, is the question you sent, ah, it's there. Fantastic. Right. OK, so um, let me try and find. I think I'm going to actually start with the first question that was asked, which, which was the question in the title of the seminar was, was statistical accuracy sacrificed to gain public acceptance? Now, there's a long essay that, that, that comes now. I'll try and summarize it, which is that that statistics is always based on judgment, which model to use, which data to use, and so on. And in this case, there's not very many models. The data is what's available, and the constraints are what there is. So was this simply a judgment call by central authority um, in its various guises? And, um, and then there's stuff about the reference to um, uh, Amy, is this all one question that, that was sent to me earlier, or is it a lot of separate questions? It was all sent as one question. Well, it's a long essay, actually. It's a, it's a long essay, so I'll have to keep going. Um, and there's, there's reference to the wisdom of crowds, and in this circumstance, the model isn't defined, neither the data, but is the outcome necessarily worse? Um, I, I think I'm going to have to summarize the question. Should the question instead have been, how can the statistical models be improved to meet the needs of a wider range of stakeholders than simply the government that commissions them? So in other words, instead of just asking, was, was statistical accuracy sacrificed to gain public acceptance, is the problem that the customers for the models were actually not the people who were actually commissioning them. Um, there's also the assumptions which I don't actually agree with, but never mind, it's a discussion. So David, you look as if you can say something. Okay. But the point of this is just simply to give you the chance to talk. So yeah, I, go ahead, David, and then Shannon after David. Great. Okay, I, I thought I'd say something to get things going, um, but the others will say something much more sensible in a moment, I'm sure. I think one of the issues is, this is something I said right at the end, there isn't a single public. There are different groups. Um, John referred to, Joe, Joe referred to um, pressure groups, and that's an illustration of how the public is divided up into different groups with different interests. So um, we're never going to have a model which satisfies everybody. Could the model be improved? Yes, of course it could. Models can always be improved. Um, provided you know what you're working towards. Um, so I, I think there are sort of fundamentally unanswerable questions behind this. We're never going to get perfection. Now I'll hand over to someone who can say something more. Shannon. Sure, hi. Um, so I'll try to uh, offer the ethicist perspective here. Um, and I want to pick up on this issue of public acceptance or public acceptability. Uh, because this is a, a really ambiguous notion, uh, because it can refer both to uh, whether the public in fact is satisfied or content or happy with a particular set of outcomes, um, 
or it can refer to the, the legitimacy, the public legitimacy of a particular process or set of outcomes where there's a sort of normative or moral issue here, right? Uh, and so I think, can we always gain public acceptance for everything uh, that uh, that we do in a in a in, the, in our roles if we are a public authority? No, we can't always guarantee that. Um, can we satisfy the demands of uh, of public legitimacy? Well, whether we do or not, that's our obligation as public authorities. So, so I think the question here needs to be looked at: What is the public's really moral right here. I mean, Joe has raised some really interesting questions about the, the sort of legal domain, but these of course overlap with the moral domain. And particularly when the law is unsettled, we often look to moral considerations to see how we ought to be guided. In the United Kingdom, the education system, a, a large chunk of it, and certainly the aspect that is administered by public authorities is taxpayer funded. And that means the public has uh, a moral right to uh, a, 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 a say in how the education system is administered. And so I think we have to start from that standpoint and keep in mind that when we talk about taking the public with us, that can't mean we have the, the, uh, all the knowledge and all of the relevant inputs and we just have to bring them where we are. It has to mean we are listening to the public as well we are also informing the public, and, and if there are misconceptions, as there certainly are in the public domain, about what algorithms are, uh, about how they have been used historically, not just in this year, right? Um, then yes, we have a duty to try to correct some of those, but a, there is also a duty to listen to what the public is saying. In AI ethics, which is my area of expertise, um, We've sort of adopted a, a motto increasingly that actually comes out of uh, disability rights activism. Uh, and the motto is nothing about us without us. And this is becoming incre increasingly relevant for uh, discussions of algorithmic decision making. So if we're going to transfer from uh, a, a system that has public acceptance, uh, that involves largely human decision making, if we're going to transfer to one that is far more automated um, or is perceived to be more automated or uh, driven by algorithms which look at aggregate outcomes more so than sensitivity to individuals, right? Well, then we need to understand what it takes to get the public on board with that. So I have some other thoughts, but I'll just, I don't want to hog too much of my time right away. So I, I'll just leave one last thing on the table. And that is that the decisions that algorithms make are not comparable with the decisions that humans make simply by looking at overall aggregate accuracy. The kinds of errors that machines make are different than the kinds of errors that humans make. And some of those differences are morally relevant. And secondly, the, the way that these algorithms operate at scale and impose the same pattern universally also has morally relevant differences with the kinds of decisions that individuals make. So uh, particularly with respect to bias, that becomes highly relevant, but we can come back to that. Ed, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. One of the great joys of doing a, a panel like this is that you get asked a question and if you get to go third, you end up responding to the brilliant points made by your panellists before you even get to the question. So I'm going to do that. And just uh, to introduce myself, I'm Ed Humperson and I'm the head of the Office for Statistics Regulation and I have the great pleasure of having people like Emily Carlis working for me and producing the fantastic report that she produced, which bore uh, very little of my imprint and, and all, all of her brilliant work, as you heard from my presentation. Um, so I do have a couple of reflections. The first thing I want to say is actually to pick up on what Shannon said. And really, um, I think this troubling notion of public acceptability is quite right. When we were doing our review of the, uh, the, the models in 2020, I was always troubled by um, by the sort of impossibility I felt of the of the, these exam regulators getting a true fix through a focus group model on how people would actually react when actually they metaphorically opened their envelope and saw their results. They tried, they tried various things. I think they tried nobly, but I just don't think they had a toolkit that could for, replicate for their test audiences 
what it was actually going to be like and how people would actually feel. And in fact, what Shannon has given us is a really very good framework for thinking about that, that actually it wasn't a problem of individual uh, acceptability is a problem of sort of general legitimacy. And that really echoes into the work that we do at, at the Office for Statistics Regulation overall, because we, we make a very sharp distinction between trust and trustworthiness. And we say the goal of a producer of statistics or a, a user of a statistical model is to demonstrate their trustworthiness, not to pursue trust, because trust is a very, um, uh, it's a very sort of, uh, uh, what's the word? It's a very kind of cumulative aggregate um, attribute uh, that, that lies in the minds of lots of individuals, depending on all the influences of them. And it's very hard to control for that. What you can control for is the signals that you give as a public body that demonstrate that you are worthy of trust. So I thought Shannon's point there was absolutely, absolutely right. And, and I think this troubling notion of public acceptability should should recur in this discussion. I think we should come back to that. About the question, uh, so the questioner ended by saying, have, have, should we have a different title for this session? And I must say, at the start of today, I would probably have been inclined to agree and say, yes, maybe the, this, this um, statistical accuracy being sacrificed to gain public acceptance isn't, isn't quite the right focus. But actually, I'm going to recant from that, because I think uh, Cathal's opening excellent presentation about the, the experience in Ireland almost directly addressed that question and it was it was really all about that and I, th I as I sensed from his presentation the judicial ruling in Ireland was almost in those terms that it's better to sacrifice statistical accuracy in order to gain public legitimacy or public acceptance similarly I think um, uh, Lindsay Patterson brought out this this point uh, extremely well uh, in what I thought was a really, really fantastic presentation. So in fact, I think this is the right question after all. So uh, rather regretfully, I have to disagree with the questioner and say, actually, I do think this is this is the right question to be asking, the balance between statistical accuracy in this sort of circumstance and how it relates to, well, I think maybe public legitimacy, would, to adopt Shannon's phrase, would be the right way to go for it. Sorry, rather long answer there, Bernard, uh, but hopefully we can unpack it's some fine. of those things. As we go I, on. I, I should add for the benefit of the people at home, uh, as it were, that the panellists have actually seen the full version of this question. It was emailed to everybody. So if I gave a garbled introduction, and if you think the panellists are giving a more coherent answer than the question was, that's my fault, uh, because it, it was a rather long question. Joe, over to you, and then we'll go on to the next question. I'll just pick up on this idea of public legitimacy, which I think is, is so important. Um, I think there's, um, uh, as Shannon has raised, there's very interesting ethical questions here. There's also very interesting legal questions and very interesting technical questions. But the question of public legitimacy is also a kind of sociological, psychological um, inquiry as well. Um, uh, when I'm not spending time looking at algorithms, um, I'm doing studies on at the moment on why people obey the law. Um, so I've been running studies on why people um, uh, follow coronavirus regulations or don't follow coronavirus regulations in some instances uh, and trying to figure out why that is. Um, and it, the kind of theoretical framework that's dominant in that space is something called procedural justice, which is the idea essentially that people accept authority when certain conditions are present. So neutrality, when people have a voice, when there's trustworthiness in officials and respect is given to people, that increases the legitimacy of, of authorities. Now, I, I know that's a slightly different context, but the, the substance of the issue is, is very similar. It's about you know, every solution that we can come up with is going to, for these kinds of things, is going to be imperfect. It involves trade-offs, it involves difficult technical, legal, ethical questions. But the public legitimacy question, that there are um, frameworks uh, available uh, for, which to, for which to analyze that question from a sociological, psychological uh, perspective, which I think could be usually uh, lent to this area. Um, and that just brings me to the, the kind of focus group technique. Um, so I, I agree there's something quite there's something quite unusual about the sum at the moment of opening exam results and um, and that kind of very you know, particular moment. But generally, there's not been much investigation on um, the public acceptability of algorithms. We're starting to see more of it come through and it's revealing some quite interesting um, uh, kind of responses. Um, so I, I do think that there's so much more, more work that can be done um, through, um, for instance, survey experiments that really draws out um, that stuff. Um, and just a final point that I, I really think when we get into this kind of conversation, um, I, I, I like the idea of putting to the public through surveys, through citizen juries, those kinds of mechanisms, whatever, um, where, pick your method, your preferred method. 
putting to them the trade-offs that we're discussing today. Uh, I think there's a, a sense in which that we can sort of take these conversations as, you know, as the lawyers or the uh, statisticians or the ethicists and let's take these to a room and discuss like the little elements of them. But generally, if you introduce the public to these trade-offs, you know, they can engage with them, they can understand them, and they can develop quite sophisticated sensibilities about them. Um, so that would be my, my kind of, that would be my reflection on the public legitimacy point. Um, Jane, did you want to add anything? Jane? It was more by way, uh, probably more by way of a, a question. Uh, uh, if it's another but, question, I'll probably ask you to put it in the chat because we need okay. to. Yeah, it's, so it's not, this is all about the public leg legitimacy of, uh, of moderating, of allowing people who have already asked their question. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is actually go on um, from something Joe has already said and maybe give you all the others a chance to answer. So one question we've had is this, to what extent was the problem a lack of public understanding of the problems associated with creating an algorithm for this purpose? So Joe has already actually answered that question. So Joe thinks that um, uh, explaining, you know, if people had understood better about algorithms, they would have been happier. But I don't know if the others want to comment on that one. Is it, was it a problem of public perception? And is the problem a lack of public understanding of the, of the problems associated with creating an algorithm? So we'll ask Ed and then Shannon and then David. Yes. yes. In short, uh, I think that's uh, a very good way of thinking about this. Um, and I don't think it's uh, simply a lack of public understanding of, well, Algorithms is the is the sort of popularly used term. Uh, careful students of our report will note that we studiously avoided that term um, because we thought it was not helpful for all the reasons that David uh, Hand provided that algorithms have been a feature of public decision making for, for a long time. Uh, what was new here was the application of statistical models to a novel situation. That that was the, 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 the distinctive thing. So we talk about statistical models. But I think there's public understanding of that. I think there's public understanding of the uh, degree of um, variability in exam results in a normal year. Uh, and a um, and the degree of standardization also is applied in a normal year. I think there was a there was a gap there. Uh, but I also think that to say that is, of course, to come from a deficit model. It sort of implies the public aren't, aren't aware and they're, they're, they, you know, they're, they're, they need educating. And I don't think that's right either. I think actually um, the, the way to think about this is the way someone like the Science Media Centre think about science communication is to say you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a given stock of public knowledge and it's our job to, as scientists, to engage with that and to engage with how best to explain our uh, latest findings in a, in a in a thoughtful and intelligent way. So yes, I think public understanding is an issue here, but I don't think I would I want anybody to interpret what I'm saying as being a you know implying that the public just need to be educated. I think it's a case of as I think maybe either Lindsay or David said that there's a flip side to that, which is better articulation and explanation of what's going on, and I think that that would have helped enormously in this scenario. Thank you. David, I think I said, could speak next. Um, OK, very short observation. <clears throat> I'm and this basically, I think, <clears throat> matches what Ed said. I'm very uneasy about this phrase, public understanding. Um, understanding of algorithms is by, by the general public is asking too much. Um, you know, algorithms are the sort of things we're talking about, very even uh, are very complicated, even a linear regression model is quite complicated and understanding that is asking for you know three years training in statistics that's not it's not going to happen what we're really talking about or should be talking about is public appreciation that this thing has these properties these are what you can expect it to do this is the way it will behave this is the way it matches and adheres with other things and so on and i think that's really that matches what i was saying and um, shannon Anything to add? Yeah, um, I'll just add that uh, I'll agree with Edward that public understanding is um, a problem uh, in, in here, but but certainly I don't think uh, constitutes uh, a full explanation 
um, of, of, of the issue such that had we simply um, engaged the public uh, in advance in a different way and then delivered uh, exactly the same uh, outputs that everything would have been okay. Um, and I think it's important to recognize this. the problem is we do have four different uh, examples here uh, that have very salient differences, right? Particularly between the Ireland example and the, let's say the, the English example. Um, and so it, it, I don't think the answer is gonna be the same in all cases, right? In some cases, better public understanding might've been enough for people to say, okay, I guess I, we understand there's no perfect solution here. We understand that algorithms are balancing these difficult trade-offs and, and the way these have been balanced seems you know, within within the limit, bounds of public uh, uh, of, of what's legitimate and, and acceptable and reasonable. In other cases, I don't think that would have been true. If you look at, for example, the English uh, uh, model and particularly the throwing out of uh, or the acceptance of the uh, center assessed grades only for the schools of a small cohort, uh, would that have been remedied simply by explaining to people in advance that, that we were gonna do that? I don't think so. I think there was a real justice issue there that was neglected um, with respect to the inability to get redress effectively, particularly for students who uh, were on a sort of upward trajectory uh, historically uh, and, and were sort of striving and attaining uh, at, at uh, levels that the system, you know, in some of these models was compressing downward. Uh, the, the lack of an effective redress uh, opportunity for some of those students would not have, I think, been acceptable to large swaths of the public, even if they'd had a better understanding of what was going on. So I, I think uh, the answer is it's complicated. Uh, you know, public understanding of what algorithms are and how they work um, needs to be uh, in, enriched, but uh, I, that's not going to address all the issues that are on the on the table here. And one last thing I'll just say is that one thing we haven't talked about is what the what the value of education is, what the purpose of education is, and did we explain to the public how these algorithms were aligned with that? Because the, the pressure to reduce grade inflation needs to be justified. What, what is that achieving, especially when that's trading off against other things? And there is a, a, a dual function of education that is it's a tricky moral subject to talk about and tricky politically. But for some people, the most important function of education is gatekeeping. And for, for others, the most important public function of education is uplift and opportunity. And those can be placed in tension with one another, quite obviously. And I don't think we've, we've really talked about that uh, enough here. So maybe that's something we can come back to. As chair, I'm not allowed to contribute to the discussion itself, but it's a very, it's a, that's a very uh, important point. I think while we're still on public perception, I'd like to go to Jane's question in the chat. And then there's a whole series of questions about the algorithm itself, which we'll come to in a minute. But Jane's question is, of course, actually builds on what Shannon just said, which is that she says the Irish judgment said that people had another chance, a retake or another route. Whereas the UK view is that this is a once in a lifetime failure. And is that perception a challenge for communication? Well, it obviously is, but can we talk about how that perception is a challenge for communication and for the understanding of the trade-offs involved in the algorithm? So um, I don't know whose turn this is to go first. Shall we let Joe go first on this one? Sorry, I don't mind if you four just shout at each other until one of them says something, but let me try and keep it. I, I haven't kept a record, so if someone's being treated unfairly, just tell me off. Joe, after you. Sure. Um, so um, I, I don't have much to say on this, but just a, a general point from some of my field of research that I think just as a as a matter of um, principle, um, like it's seen that redress is, is I redress broadly the idea to whether we take a decision or challenge it or give some opportunity to to express voice broadly it is, is really important um, and it adds legitimacy um, generally to to a process. Um, so the centrality of, of, of that is, is um, to, to legitimacy, I think, is really important. Um, my, yeah, my sense with, with um, speaking as a lawyer on this, we tend to equate, I think, redress with formal systems. 
Um, and I, I don't think that's quite right. Um, I, I'm quite keen on thinking about redress, not just as something where, you know, you, you get lots of lawyers and you go to a court or you even go to a formal system such as a tribunal, an ombudsman, or whatever. But the, there's some express, uh, ability to express vo to express your voice and complain or express your grievance about the way that you've been treated in a system. Um, so I, I do think that element of a system is, is very important, generally, to maintain the legitimacy uh, of these kinds of systems. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add. Um, uh, David, do you want to say anything um, about this, or is, have we covered it really? Ed, Ed, you go ahead. Well, just to say uh, one thing, which is um, these these four UK exam regulators in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. One of their sources of assurance to themselves in preparing their models was that, well, of course. If people don't like the grade they get on the day, they can a appeal it. Uh, now it's very, very kind of clear appeal uh, uh, arrangements set up. And b, if they really don't like it, they can take an exam. You know, they can retake. They can do a retake. And in fact, I, I, I uh, know that some uh, people, even after the um, the reversion to uh, teacher assessed grades, have opted for the retake option and you know tried their hand at getting a better grade grade in exams. And I think you know that's all true. I think the trouble is that uh, just as Jane says, the the sort of the the rhetoric and the perception, particularly around A level results in the UK or higher as um, the equivalent in Scotland, is that they are sort of life determinant, and you get a result, and that on that day that determines something you know crucially important about your your your, your future life chance life chances. So all the focus is is on that day's sort of outcome, uh, and these sort of subsequent options uh, of 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 appeal uh, and the appeal arrangements particularly in, in England probably would have been seen as being a bit incomplete by the learners who would have used them they, they might not have given complete grounds for, for appeal I, I think it was probably um gonna is probably a, a, there was not as much assurance from that source for the regulators as they were seeking really I, and I, so I think Jane's point really does hold yeah, yeah. anyone want to add any more if not, I mean, I would make the observation that no one ever appeals because they got too good a result. So mm -hmm. the ability to appeal is just a way of pulling the lever a few more times in the hope you get a better result. And that's why, uh, you know, I mean, that is why, of course, you get this reaction that says you should it should it should be a life changing event, which is also bad. And Jane has made the point in the in the chat that yes, her question was absolutely about uplift versus gatekeeping. Now, what I've got here is a few slightly technical questions, and I'd like to ask them all at once. And so the first thing is about the inclusion of the school history in the algorithm. Is that the main problem? And were focus groups supportive? The second part is how should sociological and protected characteristics be brought into algorithms? And the third part is should a model based approach even have been attempted at all? So if we, we could take those as three connected issues. Um, and I don't know who would like to, whoever starts speaking gets the first bash. Shannon, great. Yes, yes, yes. OK, so I'll just say, first of all, that um, with respect to I, I think these these are connected because, of course, the school's history um, is largely where we see these uh, social inequities uh, being reflected. And um, I, I want to come back to this this point, uh, which is often made in the context of algorithmic bias. Um, that almost always the, the bias is not created by the algorithm. Uh, the bias is already there in society and is being reflected through the training data or uh, in the case of uh, uh, a simpler algorithm that doesn't involve uh, machine learning, uh, the, uh, the data that's been fed into the, the model in another way. Um, the point I want to make about this is that um, there is, again, a salient difference between human individual bias and the kind of bias that uh, can be perpetuated at scale uh, by an algorithm that's insensitive to individual differences. 
uh, and people uh, are very morally attuned to this distinction. Um, because whether or not they actually statistically are likely to have a fair chance of overcoming bias in an individual interaction with another human, right? Whether or not they're individually going to convince uh, a hiring manager to overlook their disability or overlook their gender, or whether they're actually going to be able to, you know, uh, convince a, a teacher of their potential when they come from an ethnic group that suffers from uh, 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 profound societal bias against their uh, opportunities. Whether or not statistically someone is likely to overcome this, uh, when you're facing an algorithm that has baked in those inequalities, you're guaranteed not to overcome it, right? And so this, this uh, again, this sort of idea of the window of opportunity being closed by, by an algorithm, and then these inequalities that are not justified Right, that that we we regard as morally wrong. Human frailty. We 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 know we we carry these, but the choice to then allow them to be baked into an algorithm and pushed forward, is a very morally different thing. So I do think that these have to be taken into account, um, and to simply sort of allow these biases, particularly ones that we know are the result of of unjust inequalities, to allow these to be passed forward by algorithms um, is not something that will, will be regarded as legitimate, and I think rightfully so. Can I add a, a thought I've always had, which is about autonomous vehicles, which is, of course, if I had my way, I would remove all drivers from cars immediately and have even imperfect autonomy, not quite, but you know what I mean, um, and yet we are much more forgiving of accidents caused by people than we are of accidents caused by algorithms. How good would an algorithm have to be before we would be happy with autonomous vehicles everywhere? It would have to be a lot better than the humans because we are prepared to forgive human frailty. Um, on the other hand, I once was on a plane and uh, and I read the, a uh, uh, long time ago, of course, and I read the in-flight magazine and the it was from a pilot and he said, I very much enjoy flying to small airports because I have the chance to land the plane myself. And I thought, I very much prefer to fly to large airports because the computer will land the plane instead of this idiot who might make a mistake. So it is quite an interesting topic, but I think this is actually another thing I would add to what Shannon said, which is that if, if a, an examiner makes a mistake, you can sort of understand if an algorithm makes a mistake, you are much less forgiving. Now I should stop, go back to being the chair and hand over. Everyone has, um, everyone has uh, uh, asked to speak. I think it's David's turn to go first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you're, you're dead right about the autonomous vehicles. I, I raised that question in my, my talk that the, the level, the threshold which we set it for, for algorithms and particularly driverless vehicles uh, is much higher than we accept it for humans. Every time a driverless vehicle crashes, it hits the media. Every time a human, well, you know, very rarely does it, does it hit the media. I, I'd just like to come back to a sort of, on a sort of technical level to what Shannon was saying about um, inequalities being baked in because of biased data sets or, or things we, that we know are unjust being put in. One of the merits of an algorithm is that you, you have written down in front of you exactly what it does so that you can see and adjust for such things. Um, I have sort of considerable experience of this in the credit scoring domain where there are, as, as you know, protected characteristics which must not be used to influence a decision about whether somebody should get a loan or something like that. Um, um, the fact that you can't include a particular characteristic means that the initial reaction, this is sort of what the, the argument the industry went through. So you exclude that characteristic. You don't record that for an individual. But then you observe that um, other characteristics are being included, which are correlated with that. So you say, well, you can't include those either. And in the end, you end up excluding everything, human, everything in human beings that are correlated. But there is a sort of more strategic, slightly technical strategy to approach this. You identify the characteristic that you don't want to include, and you build a model for including that characteristic. And then you make a decision in the sort of space orthogonal to that model. So that includes from your decision 
that characteristic and the bits of the other characteristics which are correlated with it. So the fact that you can actually write down the algorithm means that you can tackle these sorts of problems in a way that you, you just can't with, with human beings. Interesting. Um, Joe and then Ed? So, so just um, picking up this point that Shannon made about the transition from uh, transition of something that we know exists into a system to, to a stated rule or algorithm. I think it's a really interesting point. Um, and uh, I, I think that generally the psychology of that for most people is quite confronting. Um, I, I think when I look at, so when you look at um, administrative decision making systems that, um, that potentially could make a lot better decisions using algorithms, um, but most people would still prefer human decision maker. That's what we, we see over and over again. Um, and uh, as, as a side note, the legal implications of that, I think, are, are, are really not yet fully known. So um, I think if, say, you know, a, a, an official in a big decision making team in a department makes an incorrect decision, um, then the, the, the kind of the way that law has approached that in lots of ways has been, well, that's just a, a rogue official um, who's made a bad decision. And we can all square this that, you know, that person's, you know, had their decision overturned and it's fixed and we can all move on and department and go back to doing good work. Um, when you have a, an algorithm, if you get a bad decision, you know, that potentially says that the, the algorithm is itself, the, the model or whatever it is you're saying, when you bunch things together like this, it's, it's, it's the whole thing is wrong, which the implications of that for for the way the courts approach that are potentially massive and the implications for potential rulings. Um, th there's there's also something I think in, uh, uh, this is not a technical term, but the, the fudginess of human <laughs> reasoning that has allowed administrators to be um, most insulated from legal uh, complaints in lots of ways. Um, so, you know, the, the courts can't look inside the mind of an administrator and sort of pull out the reasoning. They can only deal with what's on the papers, what's been stated as reasoning. You know, this this is quite uh, this will have quite a lot of implications. That move not just have moral implications, but legal implications as well. But it, it's quite difficult to imagine uh, what they are at the moment. And um, just a final point about the imposition of a model or the use of a model. Should we have used a model at all? Um, I, I think that's for that's for smarter people than than me. Uh, but the my concern is that we don't do debate really in any serious way in our system of government when we reach these kinds of points where we should use a model for these kinds of decisions or algorithms or, or whatever. Um, I mean, obviously, that's someone with a particular set of circumstances, urgency, etc. But the lack of deliberation until something goes completely wrong in, in our system of government it, it, with algorithms is, is really pronounced. Um, so I think that's something that we should think a lot more about. How can we properly deliberate these things uh, effectively in Parliament and elsewhere uh, before we decide to deploy them or officials in, in rooms decide to deploy them on us. Ed. So uh, going back to the question on was uh, school history the main problem and was it supported in, um, in focus groups? Taking the second part of that first, so uh, the focus groups certainly um, explored with with members of the public and parents and, and students alike how the whole model would work and that obviously included the past history of the school and um the, some of the concerns that uh were raised publicly about that baking and biases were raised but i don't think sufficiently to create an alarm bell in the preparation of the model uh it, you know that the, the, it was it was a factor raised in focus groups and no more strongly than that and against the backdrop of focus groups giving a broad degree of assurance to the the organizations that that did this and that goes back to the point that i i, I picked up from shannon this distinction between a sort of focus group acceptability and legitimacy um i, I think that that that's really what's going on there so that's sort of a, a a factual answer to the supported in focus group questions um on the the, 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 the more sort of um, strategic question was, was the inclusion of school history the main problem? I think my answer is, is a bit more nuanced there because it depends what you mean by the main problem. Um, if you see this story as being one where um, some, some models were designed and they didn't do a good job of predict, predicting grades that people would have got, 
I'd say probably inclusion of school history was not the main problem. Um, as we heard earlier, actually the predictive power of using school history was quite good. We saw some very clear evidence from that from, from the Scottish case. And from what we've seen, that will be replicated across the other parts of the UK. So if you want a, a model with, with sort of predictive power, uh, school history provides quite a good source of data for you. you now it has all of the, you know, the, you know so if you, th if you think the main problem is sort of statistical accuracy, then include, you know, include the, 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 the school history. If you think the main problem is public legitimacy, then you've got to think much harder. And I think you run into two, two kinds of problems. Uh, one problem you run into is this sort of baking in of socioeconomic uh, history uh, uh, and those issues really crystallised in Scotland. Um, but I think you also bake in the problem of um, the atypically outstanding student in the poor performing school losing out. And I would say that particularly in the media reporting England, it was that issue that really undermined the public reaction. It was the it was the sort of the the you know outstanding young person who was predicted three A's, not going to a very good school, who got given three E's. It was it was that student who was touring the TV studios. And I think what the effect that had was it sort of legitimized concerns from lots of people who got downgraded from an A to a B. Is it well, I've just seen this person who's downgraded five grades. It must all be rubbish. So I'm I'm emboldened in my unhappiness about my minor downgrade. So I think it depends what you mean the problem is. In statistical accuracy terms, yes, yeah, school history is a good thing to include. It, it it increases your predictive power. In legitimacy terms, it created problems. And that goes on to my third answer to the third question, should uh, an algorithm have been attempted at all? We use this term to, about being socio-technical in our work increasingly. Uh, and that means that we're not sheer techno-optimists. We're not people who blindly as, as, as the, the statistics regulatory body say, well, you know, statistics are the answer to everything, but nor are we uh, blindly sociological in saying you simply need, you know, value is all constructed. We, we, we search to say, how do you apply statistical techniques in a way which has trustworthiness, quality and value? That's always driving our work. Uh, and I think that uh, a, a, a socio-technical mindset here is, yes, a statistical model should have been attempted. It should have been attempted. It was the it was the right call to make, um, but it should have been attempted not in the sort of rather elitist uh, uh, kind of quite closed way that it was done, but in a much more open way, which paid much greater attention to these these questions of legitimacy. So they, I think I've answered two of the three questions there, Bernard, but not unfortunately. Well, the no. The one. reason of having three questions is so you don't you can choose which of the three at all to answer or any of the above. We all know how to do that. Now, I think what I'm going to do is actually to pick up a question of Lindsay's, which actually you probably already answered there, but it's a bigger question, which is assuming that human judgment, you need to have a human in a loop somehow, uh, will have a role. What is that role? Uh, in other words, how do we combine the superiority of algorithmic dis decision making with some element of human decision making? This, of course, is what used to be called the sixty-four thousand dollar question in the days when that was a lot of money. So, um, Ed, do you want to carry on speaking, and then we'll, and then Shannon, um, and then um, whoever of Joe and David hits the button first will be the one after that. So, Ed first. Uh, well, I, I suppose what I don't want to do is is to sort of uh, get in my time machine and say back in you know May 2020, this is what I'd have done and it would have all been all right if they'd have done what I'd have done. So I'll, I'll try, Lindsay, and give a slightly more generic answer, which is I think that a lot of this um, comes down to the design of the, the quality assurance uh, approach that you take when you're implementing a model of this kind. Um, and uh, what I think you need to do is to find um, a, a series of um, sort of validation tools which will tell you where outliers uh, are, are arising. Um, and I think maybe David Hand could come in here talking about the validate AI approach, which provides you with a lot of these validation tools. It tells you where those outliers are, and then you have human expertise scrutinizing the outliers, both to say, can uh, can we understand and explain why these outliers have arisen, 
And uh, and secondly, is there sufficient grounds for us, so to speak, to apply human judgment to override the model? I think that will be a really good system uh, uh, in, in general. In the exam context, I would probably, define, and so I am going to slightly go in my time machine, I'll probably define an outlier as a really significant grade move, grade move from prediction. That, that would be what I'd define as an outlier. And to be clear, that was what I've just described was not done. That was, that was not done. So in other words, the system generates its own appeals and the appeals are then settled by the human judge. Shannon, you had your hand up. Yeah, so a um, couple of things. Um, I'll answer this question and then I want to briefly come back to the automated vehicles example because I think there's something relevant there to pick up on. Um, but with respect to the question about human judgment and having humans in the loop, um, this is a really important issue because I think uh, often people naively expect this to solve the problem, uh, which it, 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 it often can't for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the speed and complexity of some of the systems that, that we're building um, make human um, checking of individual decisions sort of practically impossible. Um, without defeating the value that you're getting out of the model in the first place. So we have to think about human oversight uh, and as, as Edward was saying, and sort of quality assurance more broadly than simply the checking of individual decisions. Um, in addition, the problem of automation bias is, is, is very powerful here. So if you're told that the algorithm is better than human judgment, why would I choose to overrule it on what basis, right? Um, now, there are cases, though, where I think it does make sense to have a human in the loop um, and where there are factors that the algorithm simply cannot be sensitive to that someone must be sensitive to in the ultimate decision. Um, so we ha can't have a one size fits all approach here. We have to figure out where it makes sense to have people making decisions and, and where it makes sense to have machines making decisions with adequate oversight and auditing and uh, uh, sort of fail safes built by humans. Um, but the problem, I think, and the reason we haven't gotten there is frankly, we don't have adequate humility about these tools. When we talk to each other within the community of data scientists and, and AI folks, there's a ton of humility, right? When, when machine learning researchers get together, all they talk about is how hard this is and how difficult it is to get their models to, to work and not not break every time the data shifts just an iota. But when the conversation is with the public, suddenly we get to this rhetoric, and I've heard it here today, that algorithms are superior to human judgment. No, often they're not, because it's really hard to build algorithms that are superior to human judgment. In principle, can we often do this? Yes. In practice, does it always happen? No. And so if you look at the autonomous driving example, in principle, should we be able to build cars that drive better than humans and more safely? Yes, because humans are terrible at this. And in principle, a machine should be able to improve upon that. Have we done it in practice? Not yet. Um, I've been in the conversation around AV uh, uh, for 15 years now. And 15 years ago, we were predicted to have these on the roads everywhere within five years. And then five years later, it was five years. And then five years later, it was, and now you see a lot of companies actually retracting their investments in this because they realize that full level five autonomous driving on public roads is not imminent. It's going to take a while. And as someone who came from Silicon Valley before I came to, to uh, uh, Scotland, um, if you, and Silicon Valley is covered in Teslas, um, a, a Tesla is in many contexts a, a very sort of safe vehicle um, until at least anecdotally, and we don't have the data to really test this, but anecdotally, if there's an emergency vehicle on the freeway and you're in a Tesla, you might want to be worried, or at least you might not want to be on autopilot. That is, it seems to make sp specific kinds of errors that keep happening, which means we can guess anyway that it's not an easy problem to solve. So what I'm trying to get at here is not that algorithms are bad, not that they uh, can't be better than human judgment, but that it's really, really challenging and we are not honest enough with the public about how hard it is. And with this particular case, what would have really helped, and I know there were time pressures and it wouldn't 
have been easy to do this, but would have really helped is to have been honest with the public before the results showed up at people's houses, right? Been honest with the public about how hard it was to do this and that the results would not be perfect and that there would be flaws and and then set up a process to, to have those uh, uh, addressed. But again and again, we hear government particularly talking about how data is the solution, algorithms are the solution. And I, I think that gets us into more trouble and it ends up undermining public trust in technology more than it advances it. I, I know other people want to come in, but Ben, just to say two things. One is I completely agree with that point about the techno optimism. And secondly, this uh, recommendation that be much more honest about the limitations is one of the heartland recommendations that we, we came up with. So I, I completely yeah. concur. And then I would add on the autonomous vehicle and autonomous plane landing issue. Actually, landing a plane, I don't know how to do it, it's much simpler than driving a car because it's a simple, well-defined task. The, the equivalent car thing would probably be just keep you in the right lane uh, on a motorway when everyone was doing about the same speed, which a car can more or less do at the moment. It needs a little bit more interaction to do that. And I, I will predict that autonomy will creep in step by step rather than being a big bang. Now, Joe's got his hand up and has been patient, so we'll let Joe speak. And um, and David, I think, wants to speak again, so we'll give him another bite of this one after Joe. Just, just on the honesty point, I, I think there was a there was a wider kind of problem there. I mean, um, my partner, who's also an academic, is the admissions lead for her department, and um, it made for an interesting few weeks um, kind of processing the fallout of this. And I think there was a... a I mean, it created a large problem for, for some universities in terms of <laughs> volume of students to be taken. Um, they were serious, probably, you know, accommodation, lots of, and there was just a, a real lack of um, a, a, of honest debates, I think, in more, more, pretty much everywhere about what the, not only the, the algorithm, it's the model itself, but the, the fallout of that and the results of it. Um, so and I, I still think we're, we're going to see the, the well, Certainly, uh, speaking of my own institution, we're still seeing the effects of that now. Like, I was just meeting today about planning for the the impacts of that on the future curriculum, and it just, I, there was a real lack of honesty all around. I thought around um, uh, the process. Um, just on this this point about humans in the loop, um, I, I think um, that phrase is often I think, used as a um, uh, people say, oh, "We can bring humans in, and that will that can check it." And I think it's um, uh, this has already been touched on, but I, it's not an easy answer. Uh, to, to a lot of these problems. Um, you know, what's the benefit of having a human in a loop in a particular system? Which humans do you have in the loop? What are their roles? Um, how far can you understand the model? They're all really important um, questions. Uh, just to kind of put up my lawyer hat again, uh, just for a final point on this, I, I think the human in the loop uh, point complicates the law generally more than it makes it um, uh, easier. Um, so th there's, I think, Essentially, one argument that if you have a human in the loop, you can sort of disaggregate an individual decision um, from uh, a model or a system or an algorithm, and that gives you a kind of legal defensibility to so that as one bad decision, and you can you can defend it. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think that there's um, also lots of problems around introducing a human. So, for instance, there's a general principle in public law that an official making a decision can't fetter their discretion, so they can't basically. Uh, put themselves in a position where their decision-making authority, as, as they held it, is constrained by something. Um, so, for instance, if a, an official had a, a general power and they brought in a policy that was really narrow, they would be fettering their discretion. Um, and this problem of um, bias towards models and algorithms, et cetera, um, essentially raises lots of interesting points around, around those kinds of principles. Um, so it, we don't know how the courts are going to respond to those things. And um, there was a case brought recently, my final point on this, where a large part of it got settled in favour of the claimants. A large part of the claimant's argument was about um, automation bias. And, and they were trying to get the court to accept that where you had a essentially a filtering system, a red, amber, green system where applications were put into different categories, that the officials on the receiving end were going to be influenced by that categorization in various ways uh, and, and prejudiced. Um, and that didn't get determined, but I suspect in the next five to ten years, a court is going to have to answer that question. And whichever ways it goes on it, it's going to be a really important point. David, do you want to add anything more? 
Yeah, just just very briefly in response to what um, Shannon was saying. As I, probably everybody knows, the history of AI is littered with the sound of bursting inflated expectations. We, we talk about the two AI winters that have occurred in the past where people said, you know, it's going to revolutionize the world. In, in, as Shannon said, in five years, 10 years or something, the world would be, and then it didn't happen. And funding dried up from the research council and so on, and then it came back. And I do wonder if we are likely to see another AI winter with the pullback from autonomous vehicles, because it is taking longer. It's a bit like cold fusion, cold fusion, as you say, it's always 20 years in the future kind of thing. I think AI might be a bit different now because in recent years, it's sort of be, begun to be baked into legislation. It's not like data mining and these other sort of terms which came and have faded away, even big data is sort of fading away. I think AI might be in one way or another with us to, say, to stay. But I think um, we're, we're generalizing too much. I think we should distinguish between algorithms in different kinds of usages. Um, for example, in, in chess, uh, chess machines can beat humans, but machines and humans can beat chess machines. Um, so I think in, in that case, you, it's not exactly a human in the loop, but it's a human involved with the decision making process. And I think that's sort of different from the other sort of cases that we've been talking about and probably different from the, from the exam case. Thanks. Okay, now we've only got a few minutes left. So you've all seen the chat and I think it's time to um, give you all a chance to wrap up and I have to find some equitable way of choosing who to go first. So I think I'll do it in alphabetical order of the last letter of your name, of your surname, but that doesn't <laughs> work either because um, you all end with O-N. Oh, that's not going to work at all. So we'd better do the, first, <laughs> the last letter of your first name. And uh, yeah, so let's um, uh, let's give um, uh, David the first chance and then Ed and then Joe and finally Shannon. And Shannon, so, uh, someone asked in the chat, what did you think was the most important ethical question that had been raised? And so you can answer that um uh, uh as you wish and then i think i would i would finally reflect of, on the amusing possibility of what would have happened if all university places had been allocated at random and <laughs> two actual points because that would mean that that uh, academics would have to teach whoever happened to have been allocated to them and it would be amusing if it f turned out that, it, that all this selection they try to do actually doesn't really make any difference at all. And then the more serious question is this, whether the focus on all this this year will actually cause problems when we get back to the ordinary system. Because frankly, the ordinary system is full of injustices and arbitrarinesses and biases and so on, so on, so on. And now people will be looking for them, which they weren't before. And so I suspect there's going to be real trouble in the future. So the fact that the borderline for a B is only about a quarter of a mark away from the borderline for a C, and it's all, in other words, it's all incredibly noisy and random. And in the past, people have just accepted it. And I think once this light has been shone on the exam system, I think the exam system is going to be in a lot of trouble in the future. And it won't be to do with algorithms, it will be to do with the fact that people suddenly realise that it's all a crapshoot or largely a crapshoot and that there are enormous difficulties and, and arbitrarinesses. And I think that will cause a difficulty as well. And I can't even remember who I said would speak first, but whoever it was, go ahead. Yeah. It was David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I think. You're... And if you could try and uh, one minute each, because otherwise we'll I... we'll run over time. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you're exactly right. I said I said that during during my talk. The, the fact that people have now been sensitised to this issue, I pointed out how algorithms pervaded the standard sort of <laughs> exam grading process, and the fact that people have now been sensitised to it means we've got problems. So I'm going to just sort of conclude by coming back to the question: was was statistical accuracy sacrificed to gain public acceptance? The title of this meeting. And I, I think the answer is yes, 
but it occurred in the context of public failure to appreciate the role of algorithms in the usual process, what we've just said, the superior superiority of formal methods at predicting outcomes given certain qualifications, and, and the general impossibility of getting it right. But I think the public failure to appreciate really arose as a, an issue, it's the flip side, if you like, of inadequate communication. We've got to take the public with us. That's one minute. Ed. Yeah, we, um, we did all of this work because we didn't want the narrative around this to be algorithms are fundamentally wrong and should never be used. We wanted to tell the story of what happened in a way that highlighted, in a sense, the, 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 the particular lessons that emerged that others should apply, because we think using, not algorithms, because we avoid that word, using statistical models to support uh, operational and policy decisions is a really powerful tool. But you mustn't, this is the second message, you mustn't ever be gripped by a blind data techno optimism, particularly when you're doing a public activity, you must always factor in uh, what we call of trustworthiness and value, the trustworthiness and value of what you're doing, or, or, or I think what uh, what Shannon has described as, as, as legitimacy. So uh, this discussion, this whole event has been absolutely fantastic because I think it's really reinforced those two points. Models are not intrinsically bad, uh, but you can't do them as a sort of abstruse technical exercise. Um, I just want to say one other thing, which is it may be uh, not a good idea for a public servant to fetter their discretion, but I would hold that it's a good idea for a public servant to fetter their algorithm. Well, that leads straight on to Joe. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for a very interesting discussion. And um, as I said earlier, I think it's really important these conversations um, keep going on across kind of disciplinary boundaries um, between policy and research. Um, my biggest fear in, in, as a lawyer in this area is that we get some really bad decisions out of the courts. And well, how we define a bad decision, um, it can be maybe a little bit subjective, um, but uh, the capacity, I think, for the courts to do make really useful judgments is pretty high, but the capacity for them to uh, do things that will upset most of the people, I think, on this call uh, greatly and really clash with some of the underlying logics uh, that we're, we're discussing is pretty great as well. Um, so um, I just wanted to say that, that that's a really important part of the discussion. I'd like to see more of it um, uh, going forward as well. Um, I, I just, on the public legitimacy point, I, I think there's a um, the final point I would make is just, I think this will be an example in the longer arc of history of what happens. I, I know there were circumstances that caused a rush on in this particular instance, but when you rush into using these kinds of systems, and you pull up a system which absolutely was not perfect by any means, but then you try to change it to model or an algorithm. Not only is it a case of you can't just necessarily switch off the machine and go back to what you had before, but you've unleashed something um, that uh, is potentially much more broader uh, than that. Um, so I think it will end up being quite a, a, a strong cautionary tale uh, about how we approach these things. And Shannon, you get the last word. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you for this great uh, conversation. It's it's been a joy. Um, I'll take up the the question that you posed uh, on behalf of the questioner, which is, what is the most salient ethical issue or moral issue here? And I think it's the one that we didn't actually get to dig into, which is, uh, what is the overriding uh, legitimate uh, uh, purpose of our education system? Um, is it to uh, provide and secure opportunities for uh, individuals uh, to lift themselves uh, uh, up uh, and and, uh, and and expand their uh, their options in life, uh, or is it gatekeeping? Um, is it the ability to ensure that no one gets ahead uh, uh, who hasn't uh, somehow demonstrated uh, to our satisfaction uh, certain kinds of uh, 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 attainments? Um, and when these come into tension, um, as they as they do here. How should we uh, how should we resolve that? Uh, I think uh, what this means, and I'm going to sort of turn what has been said on its head. Uh, it's been said that this sensitized the public to issues that are going to then create a, a lot of trouble uh, uh, in the future. And I want to echo the words of um, a civil rights leader in the United States, the late Representative John John Lewis, uh, 
who said, get in good trouble and necessary trouble. And I think this might be an example of good trouble and necessary trouble that, that needs to be engaged in the United Kingdom uh, and in Ireland. And in, frankly, all, all uh, uh, countries where, where economic uh, and uh, educational inequalities persist. Uh, if this has sensitized the public further to them and the way they're institutionalized, not just in our algorithms, but in uh, the uh, whole system itself, uh, then, then I think that's a good thing and something we ought to courageously uh, embrace and confront. Thank you. That's, that's a very fitting challenge to all of us in everything that we do. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I want to say that there's been some really good discussion in the chat. Lindsay has made some fascinating comments. So he's been a sort of Lindsay's been a quiet member of the um, panel, really. Um, I thought the the comments about the the um, around the um, appeals process, Scottish government, so on, were very interesting. But what I want to do is to thank all of you very much indeed. Particularly thank the panel, but thank everyone who's taken part. Uh, thank the RSS for organising the meeting, and um, also um, let's hope that this meeting um, brings out issues late discussion and so on and so on. So that SOFA has a long tail of interest um, from the general public and from uh, decision makers, policy makers. Um, and, um, and with that, I'd like to wish you a very good evening. And I'm sorry that we don't meet in real life, but let's hope we all do soon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.